So good evening and welcome everyone to Climate and Inequalities, an event centred on the arts of storytelling, of creation and of music on this Monday night of Reading Week. On behalf of Trinity Environmental Society, uh, I would like to thank our generous sponsors, uh, Matheson and the Provost Sustainability Fund, our moderators, uh, Geraldine and Taz, and all of our panellists. We are really grateful for all of your enthusiasm, support and preparation for this event and without it, it would not happen. Uh, I would also personally like to thank my co-organiser Katie. Uh, she's not in here tonight with me, but uh, she's been a real source of ideas and driving force behind the event. So without further ado, I'll pass you on to Taz and Geraldine for the uh, event structure and introduction, and I hope you all enjoy yourselves tonight. Thank you so much, Becca. Thanks, Becca. <laughs> so when we were putting together a little kind of intro to, today, to, to, to today's event, we thought, wouldn't it be amazing if like today was a particular day that was relevant to today's event? How many more times can I say today? And we're in luck because, believe it or not, today is International Day of Thinking which we feel like is so perfect for this event because we are going to be in the presence of some amazing movers, shakers and thinkers who hopefully will inspire a lot of you to think and also will just spread information, knowledge and hopefully kind of give us the, the kind of spur that we need to continue on our climate action battle. Yeah, so we should say that we're now narr we narrowly missed International Sticky Bun Day, which takes or National Sticky Bun Day, which takes place in Germany, and uh, also uh, National Dog Biscuit Day, which takes place yet or yesterday, I think yeah. it is. So we're lucky that, that today's on, event is happening today. Yeah, <laughs> day. So we are Jodding and Jodding and Taz from the Uses Project. So for anyone who doesn't know, the Uses Project um, is an awareness raising and events collective that aims to make sustainability, the prospect of sustainability as appealing and as accessible to as many people as possible. So if you're wondering like, why would they call themselves the Uses Project? That sounds very self-deprecating. Well, actually it kind of touches on this feeling of uselessness that I know ourselves, we, we've felt in the face of the climate crisis, the climate chaos that we're seeing um, throughout the world. And uh, we would say that, you know, for long standing change to happen, it, it's, it's, it really comes down to a very simple belief in terms of if, if everyone just use less, if, if we use less resources on a mass scale, but also on a day to day level, if we tweak our habits and um, actually invest in quality as opposed to quantity, then that's when long standing change can happen. So we would have um, in the past hosted lots of events all around Dublin and then beyond Dublin and um, around Ireland, things like swap shops and flea markets and anything that could kind of encourage people to engage in the circular economy. Obviously with COVID-19, we had to move everything online, but um, yeah, so it's just to give you a feel of what it is that we do. We do lots of kind of webinars and workshops online and do lots of our work on social media. So if you don't know uh, about the work that we do, do check us out. We're at the Uses Project. On Shameless Instagram. plug. Shameless plug. plug. Has to be done. So when we started the Uses Project about two years ago, there was a kind of a, a real energy amongst the climate action movement. We were seeing, you know, young people taking to the streets. We were seeing, we were seeing a lot of kind of like a lot of a lot of groups being mobilised and taking a stand. You know, looking at quitting fast fashion or you know adopting a more vegan lifestyle. And kind of in the past year, twenty twenty. COVID has obviously bulldozed our whole lives and also somewhat impacted the climate action movement. And I think that, you know, when we are beginning to see a light at the end of the tunnel when it comes to COVID, you know, with the, with the vaccines coming out, it's, it's worth remembering that, of course, there is no vaccine for the planet. There is no one fix all solution that's going to solve climate change. And we very much believe that, you know, it is a two pronged approach. It's systemic change absolutely needs to happen, but also mobilizing groups on the ground has such a large impact. So that's why we're so excited to be to be here today at Trinity's event. And also it's worth mentioning that, you know, just being here today, just watching this webinar, listening to the attendees, you are part of the solution. This is part of the solution from the ground up. So. Well done for logging in and we hope that you're going to enjoy the next few hours of talks. Yeah, so fair play again to the environmental SOC because they've got a great uh, lineup ahead for us this evening. We're touching on lots of different topics ranging from climate justice and white supremacy to actual, you know, what's being done on the ground and also kind of a more creative approach to the whole topic. So I guess without further ado, we might kick things off. Let's get cracking. Yeah, so for first up, we have someone who we both hugely admire, um, a person who is personally inspired 
inspired us both to to be the change that we want to see around the world. Also, um, I'm sure they've influenced uh, a lot of people here who are watching this right now. Um, I, I mean, I can't stress enough what an honour it is to have her in our midst. And of course, it's none other than former President of Ireland, Mary Robinson. So for anyone who doesn't know, Mary Robinson also held the position of former UN Human Rights Commissioner. She is fiercely passionate about all um, issues related to climate justice and she's also uh, released a book under this very title climate justice but as well as all this she is co-host of one of my favorite podcasts and that is mothers of invention and i definitely recommend people to check it out if you haven't already i'm sure a lot of people have <laughs> but um i guess without further ado we welcome mary robinson to our virtual stage Thank you very much indeed. And thank you for that plug for Mothers of Invention. I so enjoy doing it with Maeve Higgins and our relationship and the way she treats me so badly, you know, but it, it is fun and yet we're serious, as you know. And I'm particularly happy this evening to take part in this climate and inequalities event. And I'm so pleased that I'll be followed by storytelling and music from other contributors who will bring out the inequalities and the intersectionality between them. Intersectionality is a long but important feminist word. It was coined in 1989 by Professor Kimberley Crenshaw to describe how race, class, gender, and other individual characteristics intersect with one another. And now, as we know, uh, this has been made even clearer by COVID-19, which is like a mirror. It has exacerbated all the inequalities in our world and the links uh, between them, as Black, Brown and Indigenous peoples are disproportionately affected because of their uh, uh, poor health, poor lifestyles, poverty generally, um, many causes. And also it has affected women who have suffered much more severe loss of jobs and livelihoods. The lack of equitable access to vaccines so that 130 countries in the world don't have a single vaccine while richer countries are beginning to roll out uh, their programs has been described by the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres as wildly unfair. So we have so many inequalities. And let's now bring this to the injustices at the heart of climate, the climate crisis. Over time, I've identified at least five layers of injustice that require a climate justice approach. The first is the injustice that climate change affects the poorest countries and the poorest communities and small island states disproportionately and much earlier than other parts of the world. Uh, that's how I came to understand uh, the impacts of climate change when I was working in Africa um, on uh, the rights that really matter if you don't have them, rights to food and water, health, education, safety, etc. And I kept hearing that things were so much worse. And Constance O'Kellett, whom I wrote about in my book on climate justice, she's the first chapter of uh, you know, told me this is outside our experience. You know, she, she was able to convey with great dignity that something terrible had happened that they weren't responsible for, but that was affecting them. That was the first injustice. And the second is, 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 is linked to that, of course, and that is the gender injustice, that women very often have different social roles, uh, less power often, less rights, like land rights, less access to capital and assets, but they have to put food on the table in drought or in flooding. They have to build resilience in their communities. And one of the movements we're noting is the work of women as actors for change in building uh, resilience in poor communities all around the world and uh, how much we can learn from them. The third layer of injustice is the one that children all around the world, including here in Ireland, have been telling us about, and that's the gender injustice. They have informed themselves very accurately and they're calling us out for failing, and they're right. We are failing to put the world on track for a safe world. And they want us not to listen to them, but to listen to the science. 
And the fourth layer of injustice is, is a subtle one, but a very important one. And that is the injustice of the different pathways to development of industrialized countries like Ireland, Europe, the United States, Korea, Japan, etc. Um, we built our economies on fossil fuel and we must honor the workers in fossil fuel, in coal and oil and gas and peat in this country in particular, uh, who helped us to build our economies. But we have to now move on and um, wean ourselves off fossil fuel as quickly as possible, but with just transition, remembering those workers and putting them at the center of planning for green jobs, either green jobs uh, to do with um, reducing emissions or green jobs to do with nature-based solutions or whatever. And that brings me to the fifth uh, injustice, the injustice to nature herself. Uh, you may recall there was a very devastating report of the UN in May 2019 about the loss of biodiversity and the extinction of species. And the reality is we are not living in a sustainable way. That in a way was all part of the thinking before the Paris Agreement earlier that year, that other framework, the 2030 Agenda and the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, the, 30, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, uh, which go beyond what the Millennium Development Goals earlier had talked about, and they're for all countries. Um, so all countries should be thinking about oceans, should be thinking about consumption, should be thinking about all of the things that are covered in those uh, 17 Sustainable Development Goals. So let me come back to my own uh, part in this um, very briefly. Uh, my own awareness of climate justice came quite late on. Uh, when I served as UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, which was between 1997 and 2002, I didn't make any speech about climate change because another part of the UN was dealing with it, um, the Convention on Climate part and the I IPC, the um, UNFCCC. And uh, I was in a silo, which often happens in a big organization like the UN. It's when I started working for a small organization I had formed called Realizing Rights on those core economic and social rights in African countries that not only did I learn about the impacts of climate change, I also learned so much from listening to the voices of those who are the experts. And that was what brought me to write that book on climate justice. It's 11 stories, nine of them involve women working with their communities, but they're also two good men. And it, it's all about listening to vital voices. I was shocked when I attended my first conference on climate, which was in Copenhagen in 2009. There were very high expectations of Copenhagen, but it didn't work out that way. And what absolutely sort of shocked me was the lack of any appreciation of the gender dimensions and the human rights dimensions of the negative impacts of climate change. And so the following year in Cancun, I uh, worked with a group of women who were influential in climate. They were representatives of the government at minister level um, and three of them had chaired conferences on climate. Uh, Connie Edegard had chaired Copenhagen before coming the, becoming the uh, uh, European Union uh, Commissioner on Climate Action. Uh, um, Patricia Espinosa was chairing the COP in Cancun as, as the Foreign Minister of Mexico. She's now the head of the UN FCCC in charge of preparing for the COP in Glasgow. And Mighty Mashaban, uh, was going to be chairing the next COP in, uh, in, in Durban in South Africa. And so we formed a Troika Plus uh, to recognize those three women of women leaders on gender and climate. And they included also heads of agencies, but it was women ministers of environment, of foreign affairs, et cetera. So quite a powerful group. And that meant that this group could uh, look for change and look for more participation of women, more parity of women, in delegations, etc., and ultimately the Gender Action Plan, working with a whole wide constituency of wonderful women who'd been struggling to get gender onto the agenda. And then this troika of women ministers obviously helped. But one of the, uh, the second major contribution of this group of women leaders, this network of women leaders on gender and climate, was to make space in their delegations for um, the women who were the experts. Uh, the frontline 
workers, uh, you know, those who are dealing with the climate issue. And, you know, Constance O'Kellett um, of Uganda became part of the Irish delegation. Um, Hindu Omara Ibrahim was also in the book, a wonderful indigenous woman was already involved, had already broken through um, to be a delegate um, in her thirties um, as chair of the uh, indigenous forum um, on climate and uh, many other women. And I, I, can, I can witness what a difference it make, made when grassroots women, indigenous women and young women were in the actual discussions with the delegates, not out in the wonderfully very vibrant civil society space, which some of you may know and recognize from COPS. Um, that's very active and proactive, but it's not powerful in influencing change. Whereas getting these voices in did actually make a difference. And I was the special envoy of the UN Secretary General before the Paris Agreement. And I witnessed the power of the small island states and the uh, forum of vulnerable uh, um, uh, countries, um, uh, the Climate Vulnerable Forum, as it was called. Uh, they pressed, as the civil society did, to include 1.5 degrees in the text. I remember the mantra in the streets in Paris, 1.5 to stay alive, 1.5 to stay alive. And then uh, Tony de Brum in particular, who's unfortunately died not long afterwards, a great hero of mine and of many, he led the High Ambition Coalition, not Europe, not the United States, Marshall Islands Foreign Minister led the High Ambition Coalition, which insisted on 1.5 being in the text. Why was that important? Because scientists had never studied how or whether we should stay at 1.5 degrees. They were already talking loosely at being near two degrees. And so the Paris Agreement asked the scientists to study, you know, what's the difference between 1.5 and two degrees? And if we have to, how do we stay at two degrees? Vital, vital questions. And that was the essence of the IPCC report in October 2018, which told us in no uncertain terms um, that there is a huge difference between 1.5 degrees and two degrees that probably during that time, the Arctic ice will disappear and the coral reefs could disappear and the permafrost, and there's a lot of permafrost up and around the Arctic region could melt and throw up not just carbon, but methane, which is a lot more serious. So they said, we have to stay, the whole world has to stay at 1.5 degrees or below. And it's doable if we have the political will, they said, and it means that we have to reduce by 45% our emissions, our carbon emissions by 2030. They said in October, 2018, you have 12 years. We now have less than 10 years. And this is really serious. And this is what this year is all about. It's about two things. It's about working, first of all, to the Convention on Biological Diversity in China, which is now in May. I'm not sure if it will be postponed again. It was postponed from last year. If it's in China in May, I think it'll have to be virtual and that would be a pity. So I'm not sure, I, I'm, not, I'm not privy to the inside track on that, but it is a very important convention. I'm part of a, a champions group that are calling for 30% uh, of the land of the world and 30% of the oceans to be protected with special zones to protect our biodiversity, to have nature-based solutions, to go back to where we should be on uh, protecting nature. And then there's the important COP26 in Glasgow um, for the first 12 days of November. And that's so important because that's where uh, governments had committed to enhance their ambition, which they'd already started before Paris in their nationally determined contributions. And you'd hear a lot about nationally determined contributions um, during this year, because every country, every government basically has to commit to be zero net zero emissions by 2050 and then work backwards to what that means in 2030 and then what that means in 2025 and what they're doing between now and 2025 and now and 2030 in order to uh, be on track. Corporations have to do this, investment companies have to do this, cities have to do this, local authorities have to do this and we as citizens have to be encouraging and telling them that um, all this needs to be done. So this is a very exciting year 
it's a make or break year. I don't think there's any more important year in human history. You know, I'll repeat that. I don't think there's any more important year in human history because we have a chance to get back on track for a really safe world, not going above 1.5 degrees. It won't be, it'll be worse than we have now because we've already put up so much emissions, but it will be livable. It will be a healthier world. It'll be a world we can look forward to and our children and grandchildren can look forward to it. And that's all in play this year. Thank goodness the Biden administration came back into the Paris Agreement. They're going to commit. They put very good people, many of whom I know very well, um, in both internationally and domestically in charge of their climate policy. But we're going to need great multilateral cooperation and great solidarity. And in many ways, COVID has taught us a lot of lessons. But I don't want to go on too long because you have a wonderful panel to follow. I want to actually recommend a book that I have loved, All We Can Save, Truth, courage and solutions for the climate crisis by two people that I know who are friends of mine, Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson and Catherine Wilkinson. And I want to quote briefly to end from um, the first essay in the book actually by a young climate activist whom I've got to know, she's Mexican. She's about 18 now, I think, and she's in college in the United States. We've worked quite closely together and actually she took over, um, Shia Bastida is her name, she took over the last of the third session of, of our um, podcast on climate justice. Um, Shia Bastida and a young comedian and young um, interviewed uh, experts took over all together. And then uh, uh, I came in at the end to tell them what a wonderful job they'd done. And I just want to end by quoting Shia uh, Bastida. I've quoted her before, but not this actual passage um, at the end of her um, uh, her contribution, she said, it's time to change our mindset towards implementing solutions. A vibrant, fair and regenerative future is possible, not when thousands of people do climate justice activi activism perfectly, but when millions of people do the best they can. I wish I could have put it as well as her. That is the message that I want to encourage. We all have to now do the best we can and those who have more responsibility have to do more, but we all have to work towards a better future and not build back better, but build forward with justice and fairness. Thank you very much. Amen. Thank you so much, Mary. And you're, you're, you're so right in saying that. I think like this year, it's it's such an incredibly important year. And I was listening to a podcast just recently with, I think it was World Service, BBC World Service. And uh, Sir David Attenborough was interviewed and he was saying that when we are rebuilding post-COVID, we need to rebuild with, with the Paris Agreement in mind. You know, it, we've such... We've such um we've such power now to rebuild into you know a more sustainable future, and um, but thank you so much, Mary. I'm like amazing. You're amazing as always, and such a, <laughs> such a big hero. Of thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um. So next up, we have our first performer of the night. So Matembe Mafu, whose stage name is Ferai Dembisa, is a Dublin-based musician, well known for captivating people through his music and words. His poem today focuses on tackling the stigma around homelessness. Matembe will also be performing two songs solo from his usual band members in Chief August Kyol. One of them, Tembe Road, centres around the exploitation of children who are forced to become soldiers. So I think if you are ready, Matembe, you may take it away. Hello, how's it going? Nice to meet everyone out here. Um, I'd like to firstly just read some pieces for you before I begin the performance. Okay, so as an artist, I am privileged and honored to share the influence the environment has on me. May it be positive or negative, because if I can express what is going on and how it makes me feel, I can build a better connection with its nature. As artists, we can share our research on the stories and history history of sites around Ireland to enlighten the next generation of learners about the positive and negative energies that may be on the grounds of new buildings or new environments. Whether it is to build the new with usable materials from skips and other places, or whether it be the lack of food sources for the eco-life that would have been accessible before modern design and civilization. That's the first message I would like to share with you guys. And that touches in the relation in relationship in relation with homelessness, because there's loads of places that are not being used, like empty hotels and 
loads of empty shelters for people to, 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 to find a place to stay, especially during COVID when there's no one on the streets, you know? So I, I, I wanted to share a message to people that like there needs to be this usage of space because there's people out there that would depend on it, you know? And I was in, in Dublin not too long ago and I wrote a poem on that specific theme and topic and I would like to share it with you guys here and now as well. Um, I've actually been doing artwork around it and around my poetry. This is the artwork I did for it. It was me and the homeless, a, a, a person who's, who's homeless. His name is Paddy, who we met in, in Dublin. And then I decided to write a poem about that experience anyway, um, in relation to our connection together. So this is how it goes. Down on Conley Bridge the last night by the black water shimmer and traffic light blues, a cold inhale refreshes cancered lungs. It's not, if not for a smile and a quick chat as I walk by, Paddy, Paddy and I would be in an awful way. To ignore another human's presence as if it were a ghost. To walk past him as he sits alone on the street pavement. To forget he was born out of a womb and mother's heart. We both share the same air and we both walk the same street. I feel there's a lack of care amongst ourselves and helping one another towards the path to health. Cleanliness is next to godliness, my grandmother would say. So for 2021, let us engage with each other on a human to human level. Acknowledge Paddy on the street who may value your time and communication more than any tenor or euro. Homelessness is a worldwide disease that is not as popular as COVID since it doesn't affect everyone. We're not so all in it together as we could be. Let us put ourselves in their shoes for a day as a challenge and as an act of empathy. The streets are quiet these days. Let change start from our unmasked faces, smiling at Paddy as we walk past after our chat. Thank you. That was my, my first poetry piece. And I would like to now invite us, another guest poet from, from Kerry to do a piece on the environment around him, him uh, that, that affects him. So here, here is Frank, Frank McCarthy, Dr. Frankenstein. Hello. Um, thanks, Mintemba. Um So this piece is based around the kind of prison system in Ireland and stuff. And uh wrote it about my nephew. So um, here we go, it's called Free Stephen. Back like I never left, cause travelers have no rights on these sentences. We spend our whole time in a cell that is six by 10 and every second hits. So I'm in it with them cause my nephew is living in hell where the devil is. If I can free him from the pen, then I will. With the bars they keep him in, a metal still. And I wish I could melt him or even his heart cause he was dealt him, but he's not dealing with cards. He's dealing with feelings that he keeps in the dark because Stephen is grieving in secret the past. But even the reasons won't heal him from that because as much as he misses his mother or even my dad, causing trouble in this world won't free him from that or bring them back and stop him from suffering. And that's a tough one to swallow. And no amount of options will work on that sorrow. They just make it worse than a person feel hollow and black out the heart, but just till tomorrow. So when you wake up, that burden will follow because grief is a curse and a fucking stalker. And it won't leave you in peace because it wants you in pieces, not one piece. So it will haunt you until you rest in peace like your mama. So Stephen, please just deal with the trauma because I don't want to see you in that box that they've locked you. But at least I get relief in that I can if I want to. Even though I know from your side, it must feel fairly rotten, but I'd rather see you with screws in a prison than Nails in a coffin. Free Stephen. Thanks a million. Thank you, Frank. Um, that was a great piece by Frank. And I, I, I just wanted to highlight other people in different environments and communities that are going through different situations that affect their environment. I feel it's very interconnected that how we're treated in the environment along with how maybe we throw away materials in the environment it's all linked because the more we treat ourselves better the more we'll treat the earth much better you know it starts with ourselves and 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 on a human to human basis but on that note i would like to um perform tembe road for you guys i had wrote, written the the lyrics for this song in mind with the, the children that were put in situations that they don't have to be at a young age being a child you're supposed to be 
our playing and having education and, and, and taking everything that's pure and positive in, but they're pushed into wars and forced to be soldiers. And that could be me or you or anybody else. Just because we're living far away from these atrocities doesn't mean it's not happening. So this piece I, I did write lyrics about was uh, based on that. Let me play that for you guys right now and recite it. down below don't pick it up up and take it to the show you feel it then you know jam the rhythms in the back seat hopping on the newest line of five you can ask me brothers who confuse control the masses skip into metal and bones to ask in we push in the pedals numbers are flashing yo the numbers keep flashing brothers who confuse control the masses skip into metal and bones to ask in we push in the pedals yo to acid, mellow out, mellow out, can we feel the breeze, as we walk with earth, and we dash with trees, swear with the night, night, good night, dreams on the pillows hidden in plain sight, yo, mellow out, mellow out, can we feel the breeze, as we walk with earth, as we dash with trees, swear with the night, night, good night, dreams on the pillows hidden in plain sight, yo, show me what you wishing, as I lift another eye, show me what I'm missing, as I pass you by, as we reach for love, as we reach for skies, keep reaching for life, reach for life, yo. Mellow out, mellow out. Can we feel the breeze as we walk with earth and we dust the trees? Swaying with the night, night, good night. Dreams in the pillows hidden in plain sight, yo. That was the song that I wanted to, to perform. I don't think I'll, I'll get enough time to do another one, but um, I will leave it on. I will leave it on that note. And I'd like to thank. I would like to thank. I'd like to thank the the, the the environmental society for setting this event up. And I'm sure Frank would like to say something as well. Yeah, thanks a million for the opportunity. And from the people of Kerry, 
Mary Robinson, you are a Tom Subla. Good night. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Much appreciated. And also, uh, before, before I go, I would like to um, share some links to some of the art um, that we do. This, the, there's an po art piece there that was done by a friend of mine and another one there. And I would like to like, share my friend Matt's art on, on the chat. So I'll leave links in the chat, chat so you guys can click into some of the artwork that me and my friends do. And hopefully we can all grow together and make this world a better place. Thank you. Cheers. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that, mate. Um, that was super. That was great. I loved it. Um, Thank I you so much. What you were saying uh, about the connection thing. I just think that's always one of the, the kind of big messages that we're always trying to hone in with people is that like, if we could all just connect the dots between our own actions and the world around us, I feel like that would really spur on such long lasting change. But like, you know, it's a case of like connecting to our fellow human, connecting to the planet. It all kind of comes together. So uh, yeah, it's all think, interlinked, isn't it? Yeah. Like if we treat, if we treat each other better, then we'll start treating the places around us, even with, you know how we connect like you're saying so hopefully that will change soon and like you guys setting up events like this will surely make an impact oh my god well if you could be part of it in any way we'd be thrilled but anyway thank <laughs> yeah. you so much again really really appreciate it someone that we have only recently got to know had the pleasure of getting to know unfortunately it was virtually in in the in the form of uh of voice notes and instagram <laughs> messages but um, she is someone who is, we have really enjoyed learning from over the last couple of months. Her advocacy and online education on the topic of anti-racism in particular has been really, uh, has been as eye-opening as it has been motivating. So Angel Arachira, if you'd like to make yourself uh, seen there, she is an anti-racism educator. She's also a geography student based in Belfast who is making an ever-growing impression with her powerful messages. Um, it's all about kind of tackling white supremacy in a predominantly white country, but also through her work, she's been an she had an increasing focus on intersectional environmentalism. And today she's going to be talking how she's seeking climate justice through racial justice and the inequalities faced by black, Asian and minority, eth minority ethnic groups. So um, Angel, you're so welcome to our virtual stage and we are so looking forward to hearing you speak. Hi everyone, um, you're gonna have to bear with me a wee bit. My computer has given up on me and my camera has just been not working for me today. Um, I think all these Zoom meetings, my computer's just had enough. So um, no you'll just have to focus on my on my lovely voice for now, which I've been told is very, very calming. Very calming. <laughs> so everyone should have no problem with that. <laughs> um, so yeah, my name is Angel. I'm a social activist and an anti-racism educator. A lot of my work is centered around racial injustice and educating people on how they can do their part in dismantling systems of oppression. But the other side of that is my passion for climate justice. And you'll find that 99% of the time when I'm talking about the climate crisis, I'm also talking about racial injustice and the other ways the climate crisis is affecting the people. Um, and there's a good reason for that, obviously. Um, so how do these two movements connect? And more importantly, why is it essential that we fight for both rather than one? So there are just a few things I'm gonna be outlining for you guys today. So the climate crisis and racial inequality are inextricably interlinked, um, obviously, or else they wouldn't be here today. <laughs> um, the exploitation of our planet's natural resources has always been closely linked to the exploitation of people of color. And if you caught me on Taz and Geraldine's Instagram story last week, you will have heard me talk about how for thousands of years, indigenous communities have been caretakers of the environment and um, not only protecting their lands, and um, they're also safeguarding some of the most biodiverse areas on the planet. Um, and what we've seen happen in these indigenous communities is industries like oil and gas continue to expand in these areas, meaning that they're having to work a lot harder to protect their land. Um, and they're also suffering from poor air quality that affects their health. So I think it's safe to say that communities of colour are disproportionately affected by the climate crisis. And it's important that this is not only recognised, but also addressed when talking about the climate crisis and our solutions. So I think a lot of people feel so far removed from the climate crisis because they're not yet directly affected by it. And moving into that space, that's been one of the biggest challenges is trying to get those around me, my friends, my family to try to take the climate crisis seriously. So I always like to give people a wee bit of an example. So if every single piece of trash and clothing you threw away went into your back garden and you couldn't take that anywhere else, then you would be 
one, more likely to reduce your waste and two, more likely to reduce your consumption levels. So a lot of people have this attitude of it's not happening to me, so I'm not going to do anything about it. Um, and yes, that's the beauty of inequalities. Those do it out so others can have. And it's really important that we all tap into that and all make ourselves very aware of that whenever we think of strategies and changing our lifestyle, moving forward to help combat these issues. And um, so, yeah, that's essentially the attitude a lot of people in our society have. I mean, it's no secret that governments can be greedy and are not always working in the best interest of the people. And in result, ethnic communities are really facing the burden of the health hazards to do with the climate crisis. Um, so my passion for the climate crisis really took off when I came out of school. I think whenever you're in school, you're heavily influenced by your peers and society at that age. And I think we all sort of <laughs> care more about how we look and following social trends and whatnot, and obviously our grades, than we are about social issues. Um, so yeah, and also at that time, I was struggling with quite a lot of racial barriers. I wasn't thinking too much about the world around me. And a lot of people are still leaning into that ignorance, I would say. Um, obviously being a black woman, it's quite hard for me to separate the two issues. Um, so I think it's just people trying to step out of that space, step out of their own head and just sort of try to focus on other things as well. Um, so I always like to say that learning and unlearning is something that's very important for anyone looking to create social change. And I find that this is really, this is what's really helped guide my thinking, guided my development as well, because we're constantly developing our thoughts and opinions and our ideas. And that's completely okay. I know some people may feel a little bit reserved to go back on things that they've said before but it's a sign of progression and it's a sign that you're moving towards more you know better better spaces essentially and um, so yeah we've been taught so many things in school such as like our history and the climate crisis that aren't really being taught properly and we're being pushed certain narratives that benefit certain institutions and industries and in turn a lot of the time we aren't being told the whole truth um, and this obviously affects the way we behave towards certain things. Like I remember whenever I was in school, we learned a lot about rising sea levels, melting ice caps, volcanoes, dangers to wildlife, et cetera. And occasionally maybe we would talk about how climate change is affecting LEDCs, but I was never really taught about policies and practices that can see ethnic minority communities being put at a disadvantage. And that's obviously something that's very, very important, um, very key whenever we're talking about the climate crisis and the fact that that was something that was held back from from you know being taught to students um you know and geography is such a everyone learns about geography whenever they're in school at one at one stage of another I did it at GCSE and A level and even at both them stages um talking about how policies and practices and things like that that can see ethnic minority communities at a disadvantage that that wasn't a topic of conversation um, and that's really one, uh, one way the school system can let us down and it also makes us realize that we need to think for ourselves. So yeah, whenever I was being taught about the climate crisis, it sort of made me feel as though I was very far removed from the situation. And I think a lot of people can relate to that. Um, unless you've done your own research yourself, I think a lot of people will still feel that way. Um, so yeah, I felt that there was nothing I could do as an individual to help combat this um, and never taught about consumption habits, what I could do to help how I can make small changes in my lifestyle or who was really responsible for this rapid destru destruction of our planet, essentially. And, you know, we are being pushed the same reduce, reuse, recycle. I know everyone knows that by now off by heart. Um, and I think that makes people feel like they're doing enough or that's all they can do. And that's not their fault um, because ultimately this is what we were taught from a young age. And um, we, you know, I know there's a lot to say for being large corporations accountable. It's very important. But mass mobilization is also very important as well. And that's also something that's um, sort of been hidden away from us growing up in these spaces. So we need to recognize that everybody has a part to play. And I feel like we've just become so used to being spoon fed information. It's quite difficult to break away from that, but it's very essential that we do our own thinking, our own research, and most importantly, we do what we can. So moving forwards, we need to be intentional and centering the most marginalized members of society whenever we're having these conversations. Things like disability, gender, race, economic status, sexual orientation, all play a factor into how you're gonna be affected by these things. 
you know, for a long time, I found that diversity was never really an important factor when deciding who was leading these conversations or who was involved in these conversations. Um, but if we want to move into more, towards more like inclusive spaces, then we need to be more intersectional in the way we have these discussions. When we're talking about climate solutions, it's essential that we factor in how this will um, affect all members of society. So I always like to say to people, if you have an ability to take action, then you have a responsibility to take action. Find your passion. Are you talkative and confident enough to be a speaker? Or are you more reserved? Um, are you more reserved and you, know, you want to step back a wee bit and would you make an organizer? All of these roles are important. Um, discussions like these are very important in helping reach a larger audience of people. No part is too small or no part is too big. Um, I always say that not only are climate justice and racial inequality interlinked, but if we can get everyone to fight for both at the same time, then we have a lot more fighting power for both movements. Um, so yeah, and then just going back to the education side of things, talking about intersectionality, which is something Mary brought up earlier on, is very, very important. And I just wanna stress how important it is that we do our own research and we tap into our own thinking because the first time that intersectionality was brought up in an academic environment for me was only three months ago in a university lecture. Um, and that's very disappointing from someone who studied geography the whole way through school. And um, for something as so important as intersectionality, I only heard it once in that lecture and it was um, very brief as well. And then whenever I wrote my, it was an essay on feminism that I did. And whenever I wrote my essay, I made, <laughs> made a very big point to discuss it quite a lot. Um, and I think that kind of works in my favor because it's a very, very important, important thing to bring up whenever talking about all these different social issues. Um, so yeah, I just, I just wanted to make everyone aware of how important that was. And then after I finish speaking, I always like to give a call to action. So today my call to action is for everyone to write down their climate equality goals. And that can be weekly goals or a big goal that you will have achieved by the end of the year. I always say that, you know, don't do a big massive change. Something small, you're more likely to stick to it. So that can be something like stop buying fast fashion. Um, not only will this have a more positive effect on the planet, but you're also avoiding contributing to the devastating social impacts the fast fashion industry can have on the garment workers, such as poor, unsafe working conditions and lower wages, et cetera. Um, I started the, what's it called? The no new clothes, <laughs> I know, no new clothes for a year challenge back in May or June, and it's going very well. <laughs> um, obviously, there are some essentials which I've um, had to buy, but I've made a point to buy from um, either a, a sustainable organization or off Depot. But something like that, which it was a huge change in in my lifestyle, because it's you know completely stopped buying fashion things like that um, and whenever I had an event or something that I, I needed to needed to get something it was quite difficult for me because I don't have a huge wardrobe as it is um, but yeah it's just something that was challenging for me that I knew would have a better impact on the people on the planet um, and that started off with me making a big do donation to an organization called Labour Behind the Label and I recommend everyone to go check them out because they do amazing work they campaign for garment workers rights which is very important so, you know, if you're going to stop buying fast fashion, I always say, like, if you're going to do an action and make sure it is benefiting not only the people, but also the planet as well. So, um, yeah, killing two birds with one stone. And um, another thing that you can do is maybe go vegetarian or go vegan four days a week, something like that. Um, and it could also be donating or protesting to protect like indigenous communities from deforestation. Um, from the fires that have been set by farmers, cattle drivers, etc., who want to raise huge chunks of the forest to expand their business. So, you know, I always say it's not about making yourself feel good. Obviously, it does because um, it's nice and um, feeling as though you're. It, I, I was watching Geraldine and Taz's Instagram stories the other day, and they were talking about the technology and the impact, um, like your phones can have on the environment, etc. And I think. They said something about like rage against the, mach um, the machine or something, <laughs> something like that, which really resonated with me. You sort of feel like you're, you know, part of the people. Yeah, <laughs> you're, you're really going against the large corporation. So obviously it is going to make you feel good, but it's not just about making yourself feel good. It's about making the world a more equal place 
So not only do you also have to do your part to reduce your impact, but you also have to work on making sure those who are most negatively affected by the climate crisis can live a more equal and better, better quality of life, essentially. Um, so yeah, you, um, you may also want to set up maybe doing a donation every month or every couple months, just what you can. Um, it's a great thing to do. And But the biggest thing that I would say is to continue to center and uplift Black voices and um, BIPOC voices. There's a lot of people doing work for the Black communities to help protect their communities who are struggling um, and could really use the support. Um, so if you can afford it, I would definitely recommend donating. Um, so yeah, there are just some calls to action. I hope I haven't went over my time. Um, I think I'm all right. Um, but thank you to everyone for joining this discussion. And I guess I'll pass over to Taz and Geraldine. Go Angel, thank you so much. <laughs> You've touched on so many incredibly relevant and thought provoking. Taz is furious writing, precisely writing notes ideas. as you're talking. I, I, thought, I thought it's so difficult <laughs> to pick up on your accent when you're talking about such amazing and thought provoking topics, but your accent is just dreaming. It's, 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 just, it's just like music in my ears but um I, I talk quite fast so I hope <laughs> I hope everyone was able to follow along with what I say no it was really really amazing Angel and you know so much of what you touched on like it, it, even like in particular you know the role Indigenous communities have in safeguarding biodiversity like it's really made me both Geraldine and myself like question like who's being credited with this climate action movement or like who's being credited with this like sustainability movement it's so frequently not the people who are seeing on the front of the newspapers or on our Instagram you know it, it is the the communities that are behind the scenes are often you know people of colour and Indigenous communities so thank you so much and all the work you do online it's really amazing Angel for president. <laughs> so following on, <laughs> following on from Angel, we are going worldwide. Worldwide! Woo! Um, Lisa Merton is a filmmaker based in the US who brought her creativity as a weaver together with a drive to create social change, forging a filmmaking process that places community activism at the forefront. Today, Lisa will be telling the story of Taking Root, the vision of Wangari Matai, a film that sparked a friendship with one of the most inspiring women in the environmental movement. So Lisa, if you're ready to go, you might take it away. I'm ready to go. <laughs> Welcome, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you, Katie, Becca, and the Trinity College Dublin Environment Society for organizing this event and for inviting me to speak about the making of our film, Taking Root the vision of Wangari Mathai. I'm just gonna make my, well, I guess I'm gonna make this full screen or am I full screen? I don't know. Uh, sorry, I seem to have messed up here. Um, anyway, Professor Wangari Mathai would have turned 80 on April 1st, 2020. In September, it will be 10 years since she died. Wangari understood already in the 1980s that climate change would most affect those that had least to do with causing it. She recognized that inequitable distribution of resources was at the root of much of the conflict in the world today, and that climate change would only exacerbate that inequality. For me, Wangari's legacy is vital to our understanding of the natural world, how to heal it, nurture it, love it, so that we all may live. I'm gonna show some photographs that we took while we were making the film. I've also written down what I'm going to say so that I don't get carried away, which happens to me when I'm talking about Wangari. I think that together they will give you a sense of what we experienced over the time that we were working on taking root. I will start those photos now. Let's hope that works. So how did it happen that a filmmaking couple from Vermont in the Northeastern United States came to make a film about Wangari Muta Mathai, the first African woman and the first environmentalist to win the Nobel Peace Prize in 2004 for quote, her contribution to sustainable development, democracy and peace. We were asked by a foundation to do an interview with Professor Mathai and make a 10 minute film about her with <coughs> excuse me, with some archival footage. At the time, she was a visiting fellow in uh, conservation at Yale University in Connecticut, not that far away. I don't think we were at all prepared for whom we were about to meet. Wangari glided into the room, her colorful garment dancing around her. She had a powerful presence, 
a strong handshake and a luminous smile. She was beautiful, quick to laugh, and a wonderful storyteller. It became clear as she told us her story that she was brilliant, very courageous, and humble. As Alan, my filmmaking partner and cameraman said, she's a cinematographer's dream. We were completely enthralled. President Daniel Arap Moi was still in power in Kenya at the time of the Yale interview and had been since 1978, 24 years. Wangari had been brought into direct opposition to him by her environmental activism, quest for multi-party elections, democratic space, and the rights of women. The Greenbelt Movement, the organization she founded under the auspices of the National Council of Women of Kenya, empowers communities, particularly women, to conserve the environment and improve livelihoods by planting trees. It helps to raise awareness of the ways in which a degraded environment relates to the problems people face in their communities and nation. As she spoke to us, her tone was urgent. She was clear in her vision for the people of Kenya and the land that had nurtured her. Moy's government was destroying the environment, grabbing public land and selling it to the highest bidder, jailing dissidents, disappearing people, and clamping down on the press. She described it as a terror government. She recounted with riveting detail the harrowing events at Freedom Corner when she had led a large group of women on a hunger strike to demand the release of their sons who were political prisoners. She was brutally beaten and unconscious when she was rushed to hospital. She remained there for days, guarded around the clock by a Greenbelt Movement board member. She had dared to speak truth to power. Look at her, what a face, huh? And paid for that courage over and over. Our interview lasted for several hours and afterwards we were pretty much stunned by what we had heard because her story was something everyone needed to hear. It was, it was really a story for our times. Wangari, what would you think about our making a longer film about you and the Greenbelt Movement, we asked. She was delighted. That would be very helpful for us, she said. You must come to Kenya. How can you make a film about us without coming to Kenya? And we shook hands again, and as she would say, the rest is history. At that time, we were working on another film, so we weren't able to travel to Kenya right away. In June of 2004, Alan made a first scouting trip to Kenya, and I worked here at home raising our recently adopted daughter, Rosica, while trying to raise more money to make a more in-depth film and learn absolutely everything I could about Kenya, the Greenbelt Movement, and, Gar and Wangari without being there. I should say that Alan and I have spent our lives living in rural places, and we shared that experience and understanding with Wangari. Wangari paid attention to the interconnectedness of issues and not their separation. She would say, once you start working with the environment, it all comes into play. Women's rights, human rights, economic justice, fair trade, equitable distribution of resources, democracy. The Greenbelt Movement was planting trees, I mean, plant, planting ideas as well as trees, and it still is. So how are you gonna teach people to care about the natural world if they are poor and will burn the last tree standing to cook beans if it will save the life of their child? You show them how healthy, intact forests and fertile soil will support them better while sequestering carbon, while sequestering and storing carbon, and providing habitat for biodiversity. You teach them to plant indigenous trees that hold the soil and filter water through their broad root structures. You compensate them for their work, just a few cents for every tree they plant that survives until they're on their feet and can see the benefits of repairing a degraded environment, an environment that they too have helped to destroy in their need for resources. They learn that they have the power and knowledge to take care of themselves, to better their land for the health of their families and their communities from the grassroots up. You're seeing these pictures again. They're, they're wonderful pictures. I hope you don't mind seeing them a second time. <laughs> On October 8th, 2004 at 5 a.m., a friend called who'd been listening to the BBC and said, 
Wangari Mathai won the Nobel Peace Prize. She won the Nobel Peace Prize. Whew. We, we couldn't believe our ears. And of course we were totally delighted and, and knew there was no better person to receive that great honor, putting the environment front and center. But suddenly there was more pressure and there was a lot at stake. But we also knew then that we had a perfect ending for film. In the photos, you'll see some of us on location. We were an unusual filmmaking crew. Our then six-year-old daughter, Rosica, came along with us. She became an ambassador of sorts. The women in the villages would look at us, look at her, smile, and off she would run to play with their children. We had no script. When we make films, we follow our noses. As documentary filmmakers, we listen well and are open to where the story might lead. Because we didn't meet Wangari until 2002, we had to build the context of Kenya's political and environmental history. Someone would give us relevant archival footage on an old VHS tape, and then we'd go to the media houses in Nairobi to try to find the original. Often, they would deny having it, and we'd say, but we know it's yours because of the jingle at the beginning. And then they would reluctantly disappear into the belly of the building and come back with tapes, sometimes con containing clips that we, we didn't know about. You have to remember that for 24 years, Kenya lived under a dictatorial and autocratic regime and the media was under, insult, under assault. So therefore they hid their precious tapes. One day in November, 2004, while we were in Kenya filming before our journey to Oslo with Wangari for the Nobel Peace Prize, we were planting trees in the degraded Aberdare forest. It was hot. I asked her if she wanted some water. She looked at me and said, do you have water for everyone? No, I didn't. Well, she said, I don't want any water. There was a lot of pressure on Wangari at this time before the Nobel Peace Prize. She was in demand. We left her in peace and used the time to travel and film the women's groups in different parts of Kenya. Later on, she gave us many opportunities for interviews, for visits, for relaxed meals together without cameras and sound equipment. We spent a lot of time with her in different places in Kenya and other parts of the world. When the film was finished, she sometimes came to screenings and that was the best. Knowing Wangari for nearly 10 years changed my life. I learned from her that if I truly want to make substantive change, as she used to say, I need to be committed, I need to be persistent, and I need to be patient. March 3rd is Wangari Mathai Day and Africa Environment Day. On that day, we will start posting some clips from our interviews with her. You can look for them on Greenbelt Movement social media. If you would like to see Taking Root, it has been streaming on our website since April 1st in honor of Wangari's 80th birthday and the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Our website is takingrootfilm.com, the green belt is greenbeltmovement.org, and the Wangari Mathai Foundation is wangarimathai.org. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Lisa. That was super. <laughs> Round of applause. Um, but you're a fantastic storyteller. I can listen to you all, all evening. Um, I, I just think that the past- I had a good teacher. Pardon? I had a good teacher. I had a good storytelling teacher. Oh, I, I believe it. She taught you well. Um, I do think that the, the power of storytelling in this whole kind of climate movement is so important to, to get the message across and you do so, so well. I'd love to watch uh, the movie and, and learn all about Wangari and the Green Belt movement. Um, I also love the idea of your daughter being like a little ambassador. Um, she was. She was, yeah. she was great. And she even did sound for us sometimes, you know, held the microphone. Oh, fantastic. Amazing. Um, so I guess we're going to move on to our next person. Absolutely. So thank you so much again, Lisa. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Um, so from small scale community creativity to large scale consumerism, we would love to welcome TJ Mohammed to our virtual stage. So TJ Mohammed has exhibited his works across the world, receiving a multitude of accolades and residencies across New York, the Ivory Coast, Nigeria, and Ghana. His works address issues of excess in both production and consumption, as well as a history of disregarded or forgotten objects and how they interplay with issues of migration, gender, social, and environmental justice. 
So today, TJ will be discussing his piece, Welcome Home. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you for having me here. Uh, there's something I wanted to share. I cannot find it. Um, most recent. Where am I? Yeah, so uh, my name is TJ Mohammed. I was born in Ghana, but currently uh, live and work in the Bronx, New York. And in the Bronx, New York, what I do mostly is working with communities and also creating installations. Um, those installations are mostly uh, made with found objects. Um, Taz, can you uh, see me or see my screen? Yeah, it's all good. All good, TJ. Okay, great. Yeah. So um, growing up in Ghana, um, I was engaged in a lot of um, like childhood activities. This picture you are looking at, it's not me, but this is um, an idea of how um, I got into working with found objects and thinking about the community and environment until now when I'm working with um, the current project that I'm working with, including Welcome Home. So I used to be called Kubolo boys, which is um, like street boys, people who collected objects. But after school, I started uh, investigating in, in other objects and materials that I would use in my works. These are um, what I started, I found fabric scraps, metro cards, and then bottles, kettles. But here I'm only talking about fabrics in this um, forum here. DJ, hey, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but we actually can't see your presentation. We're just looking at your desktop. Oh. You can um, click into whatever uh, photos you were describing there. Um, we, we can just see your desktop. On your mouse move. Okay. Oh, <laughs> and I'm, I'm seeing it here. Okay, zero. Let me see. Okay, stop sharing and share again. How about now? Yes. yes, brilliant, super, thanks oh. so much. Oh, I can actually. All right, so um, this was the first image that had me, um, you know, not me, but it is, it is a representation of me and um, what I said about how I got into um, art and how I got into founding, uh, working with found objects and thinking about the environment. Um, to move from here, I would just go with a quote by Nelson Mandela, which says, it is in your hands to create a better world for all who live in it. And when I was investigating on materials to use, I, was, I started using a lot of fabric scraps, which I collect from across the world, from every community that I engage with, uh, from Ghana, Nigeria, Ivory Coast, Trinidad, here in New York, I do a lot of that too. And I use it to create installations. So collecting from seamstress scraps of fabrics from seamstress's store, I create in, um, installations which have abstract images and incorporating history and also um, the complexities of the African and African American um, experiences also. And this is Welcome Home. So this series here, um, what I'm doing in this series is I'm thinking about how Africa has been used as a dumping place and how Africa has over the years been um, seen as a place of like refuge, but at the same time, organic materials are also produced. But how can um, the West use Africa as a table of collecting what they want to use? They have to then feed Africa with money, with new technologies, we tend to harm the environment. And then later all the natural resources are taken from the continent and back um, outside of it. So in Welcome Home, what I'm doing is I'm incorporating all of this, but it all started when um, the French uh, president, uh, Emmanuel Macron, made a statement about taking back all the um, artifacts and crafts that were stolen and looted from Africa. But since 2017, 18 and 19, now up to now, nothing has been done about it. So all this work is as a reference to that. And conceptually, it's also linking back to a music that was created in 1975 by a group called Osibisa, where they talked about welcome home. So there is an idea of like new colonization in it. 
And then, so at the same time, referencing the African American histories and the complexities of living, where I tap from Marcus Garvey's work uh, Back to Africa, where he encouraged us to go back to Africa and to build these um, communities. So the, what you see in the background are photographs that I take from the installations you see earlier, and then I repainted it. So this act of repainting, um, sort of like resilience, retaking um, what, you've, what has been lost, and also referencing the aesthetic beauty of the African um, environment and, and the African culture and heritage. What you see in the middle, which looks like gold, that is um, gold leaf, what I use, uh, the edible gold leaf, I use it as a reference to how we are eating um, our society and then thinking about what legacies are we leaving for the ancestors. So I'm bringing these images that were looted out of Africa back to Africa. And the same context, there is a component that is referencing to what the Chinese mostly are doing to Africa, which we call the Galamse, if you are very familiar with it, where illegal mining is happening, where all the goodness of the soil is taken, and then the soil is left with uh, chemicals and damages, which causes erosion and harm to um, society. I've been moving very fast with this. I'm also looking at time, but I'm very, very comfortable to talk about, uh, I mean, to explain further with questions. So from all of this series, Welcome Home, I'm gonna play a few seconds video and I use a photograph of my daughter here. So I painted my daughter and then the title of this work is, um, is Today Eating Tomorrow's, um, is Yesterday Eating Tomorrow's, uh, is, is Yesterday Eating Today's Tomorrow. Yeah, so today being, us um, being the kids yesterday mean meaning um, the ancestors and then the tomorrow which is referencing the future so what are we leaving for these kids that are growing this is going to be an installation that would um, incorporate photographs of babies painted in baby cribs installed and then i will do a video installation of um the, the environment and how it's been damaged. So here the light glowing is neon and it's going to show an image on the ceiling. Um, I'm looking at over a hundred and maybe 50 to 200 pictures of babies. So if you are here, you could just drop me a link or follow me on Instagram and I would, I'm very happy to take photographs of any babies who are sleeping the idea is for me to repaint them and include in this installation to reference what, um, what you know, to question what legacies we are leaving for this beautiful um, youth. And I would like to pause here and thank everyone, thank the organizers, thank everybody who has been part of this um, incredible um, panel as well. And thank you, Kadi, Taz, and Geraldine. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was that was so amazing. Your art is so incredibly beautiful. And I think like Thank the vision of your daughter really does kind of, you know, it hones in the idea that, you know, we are kind of fe we are feeling the effects of climate change now, but mm -hmm. we're not feeling anything of what it's going to be for the next generation. And kind of like when you see when you when you have a child, I can only imagine as a parent the sense mm -hmm. of responsibility that you must mm -hmm. feel to, you know, to mobilize action and try to tackle climate change. So it was really yeah. amazing. I only wish that. either of us had a baby that we could take a photo of. <laughs> yeah, so, all right, thank you for having me. Um, okay, so next up to our virtual stage, we have Nim Ralph, who is a social justice consultant and facilitator for a wide range of organizations like Transgender Europe and Greenpeace. They have been a leading force in campaigning for trans rights and gender equality. Nim began their activist journey with the climate movement and for many years took on leadership positions and co-founded organizations to raise awareness of how the movement was not always the most inclusive. So I'm really looking forward to this one, if you want to take it away. Thanks so much and thanks for having me. I feel like it's a hard act to follow after TJ. Um, yeah, so I got into activism uh, through the climate movement over 15 years ago. Um, and something that was really present to me in that space 
was always uh, who I was in that space as a queer, disabled, brown feminist. Um, and so I spent years working within the movement to try and address its issues with racism, ableism, classism, colonialism and patriarchy, uh, while also trying to protect the planet from the worst forms of its resource extraction and exploitation. Um, and now at this point in uh, my kind of activist lineage as a trans activist and anti-racist organizer and a climate justice campaigner, um, when I look back through the work over, over the last 15 years as I've been active, I see that there are patterns that are present in all of those systems of oppression. Um, there are real parallels in the ways that humans extract from the planet and create borders and control to police populations and service of profit and the ways that humans extract what they need from the bodies of people and create borders between our bodies and control us in service of prof profit. Um, and I think really, uh, as many other panelists this evening have actually, have actually touched on, to understand the relationship between gender and climate or oppression and climate, we have to first understand colonialism as the driving force that um, corrupted both for the extraction of resources. Um, so many of the ways that we understand and categorize people in the modern world were constructed explicitly by Northern Europe in order to justify their pro project of global do dominance and wealth extraction and accumulation, sorry, wealth accumulation through extraction um, via colonialism and industrial capitalism in the 19th century. Um, in order to do that, they needed a workforce to deliver the expansion and extraction of the planet. And there were certain types of bodies that were deemed useful and not useful and differently useful in that conquest. So colonizers assigned value to different human life to morally justify to themselves the degradation and dehumanization of different peoples in pursuit of personal wealth. And a key function of that dehumanization was to reduce people to bodies and to reduce bodies to vessels of labor, uh, a tool of production. So um, again, as been, has been touched on this evening, black people were enslaved and forced to labor to expand the extraction of resources for Europe, while disabled people were deemed unfit as they couldn't produce labor needed in an industrial workforce. Work for, workforce. Um, LGBTQ plus people were deemed immoral because we weren't able to produce for the workforce that was needed for industrial expansion. And women would demonstrate, uh, who demonstrated any desire outside of the norms of heterosexual reproduction were institutionalized. In many ways, this is the original identity politics and it's the ultimate form of cancel culture. In this system's bodies uh, are reduced to their capacity or lack of capacity for industrial pr production. Resource extraction and exploitation of our planet could not and cannot happen without resource extraction and exploitation from our bodies. The destruction of our bodily autonomy is in intrinsically bound up with the destruction of our planet. And therefore liberating our bodies is intrinsically bound up in the fight to prevent the destruction of our natural world in pursuit of profit. So that's like, this feels like a long time ago. And of course it's not, um, but it also shapes not just how corporations and governments and profiteers still manifest kind of colonialism and ex exploitation extraction of resources today. It's also present in our climate movements. So climate movements today are shaped by those legacies. Um, there's a reason that the modern climate movement is conceived of as white, as ableist, as middle class, um, and so on and so forth, because even though communities of color, uh, working people and so on have been in practice of environmental stewardship since the beginning of time, um, the movement that positions itself as the environmental movement poses itself as such through dominance. It has the power to say it is the movement and therefore it is so. But more than that, uh, the environmental movement and environmental protection, as we know it today, came about through explorers, people that today we might call dude bros, uh, patriarchal men seeking out, conquering and fencing off. Um, it came from a view that nature that wasn't being used for work or production was to be explored. Um, and instead of, that, of its function being work or production, it was now to be admired like a woman, enjoyed like a woman and separated from regular life like a woman. Separate, save and limit who touches it. Um, and so in that way, we can start to see the ways that patriarchy, um, white supremacy, ableism are all bound up in the same conceptualization of the planet. 
So land is constructed in white supremacist patriarchy in a crude sense, much like women. Uh, the whore or the virgin. Extract or protect. Mass produce or do not use. And yet an ecosystem is a living thing that is with us, but not about us as humans. Um, and so this construction of saving the planet is actually about stripping the planet of its own agency, like women or gender minorities and other peoples oppressed um, and actually categorized by the dominance of uh, domination of colonialism. So engaging in modern environmental movements is like trying to interact in a system that is designed in that model with well-meaning people who actually recreate often this power relationship, the saviors. Um, a decolonial feminist approach to the environment is that we are part of it, we are interdependent with it. It's a relationship of mutual respect, that we belong to the land and not that the land belongs to us. And I think we're really seeing now in the West, uh, and particularly um, I'm based in London, particularly in sites of, uh, in Northern Europe, in the West, in sites, uh, places where uh, the extraction of labour um, and resources profited most, I think people are really now pushing and driving towards a different approach to environmental change to climate justice. Um, and some of that, it's, I think, is interesting if you look to the US, some of how that's happening is things like um, movements pushing for the returning of stolen land. And even that is problematized as it's dependent on a colonial assumption of land ownership rather than the land owning us. Um, so these aren't easy things to grapple with, um, but by any means, but uh, really we do need to change our relationship. So in conclusion, um, social relationships today um, or uh, in this moment are the legacy of social relationships that were designed around extraction, labour and disconnection in order for this system to function. Gender and gender laws break us from our connection to the land. We can't change our relationship to the land, therefore, without changing our relationship to gender, disability, race, culture, class, and so on. Um, and as a trans activist, I think that trans feminism particularly um, is a useful framework to think about this because it moves our understanding of gender away from the dichotomy of biological essentialism um, and on one hand and the choice of production uh, on the other, it kind of breaks that, that binary, that dichotomy to thinking about true bodily autonomy, to the destruction of the borders um, that are imposed on our bodies and ourselves and expanding our choice beyond the limited construction of white supremacist patriarchy to the choice of, uh, sorry, beyond choice to freedom, to real autonomy, into a coexistence with ourselves as body and spirit instead of the production of a predetermined body and gender. Um, and we do well to apply that lens to climate justice, refusing to be limited by the binary choice of industry or preservation to one that allows us to build a relationship with land that understands it as autonomous, expansive and free. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Nim. That was so interesting. I just, I love as well how it seems like everyone's kind of getting this natural um, theme of connect, connectivity and connectedness to our set between ourselves and each other and, and the land as well, the way you touched on that. But also, I love how you kind of take this historic, uh, historic look on topics that I feel like are kind of only coming into people's ether maybe in the last year. Um, such an interesting stance um, and perspective on, on all these topics. So thank you so much for speaking with us today tonight. Um, so next we have Kaylee Wood and Daniel Sarah Ker Karazik from ACMJIS. So ACMJIS is an acronym for Artists for Climate and Migrant Justice and Indigenous Sovereignty. So they are a Tor Toronto-based group that supports the independent work of artists pursuing transformative political projects. Besides advocating for climate action, they stand in solidarity with people fighting for e equity in housing, health and the criminal justice system. So Kaylee is an arts administrator and theatre artist who specialises in creating educational materials for audience development. Daniel is a songwriter performer and today they will be offering a lyric contribution in the form of poetry. So touching on themes such as queer sexuality and climate anxiety. Take it away guys. <laughs> Thank you so much. Can everybody hear me? I, I think that's a yes. Okay, uh, so I'm Kaylee and I'm just going to tell you a little bit about organization and what we do and then I'll throw it over to Daniel Sarah who's going to share uh, a performance with everybody. So um, 
Yeah, I'm Kaylee. I am from Artists for Climate and Migrant Justice and Indigenous Sovereignty, uh, which we often pronounce the acronym ACMGIS, which confuses uh, a lot of people until they know what we're talking about. Uh, the name is really long because we really believe in the inter intersectionality of all these issues of justice, and we often joke that we want to just keep adding things to the name. Um, so I, I really want to thank the Environmental Society for having this event with that focus on all the ways these different issues of justice inter intersect. And especially thank you to Nim just now for sharing such a really eloquent exploration of um, a lot of those intersections. That was such a fantastic uh, way to set the stage. So tell you a little bit about what we do. We started a couple of years ago um, with a small group of sort of friends and acquaintances who are from the theater community here in Toronto, where I'm based, where we're, our whole group is based. Uh, and we were talking about how can we activate our theater community, our colleagues, to be more involved in kind of direct action around climate change, be a part of the activist movement. Um, how can we get them to use their storytelling abilities and the resources that they have access to, to come together with the activist community in Toronto. So we came up with the idea of, uh, of hosting a day where we would educate our theater colleagues, we would invite anyone that wanted to come and we'd have speakers about um, climate science, about uh, electoral activism, direct action, um, and some of the intersections as well. We had a speaker about migrant justice and how migrants are uh, deeply impacted by the effects of climate change. In Canada, that, that's a particularly big issue. Um, and so that was the morning. We set it up. It was a free event. Anyone that wanted could come. A few of us just paid for the, all the speaker fees with our own money and catered lunch for everybody because we really wanted it to be kind of an inclusive environment where anyone could come. And our definition of artist is super loose. You know, anyone that wants to create can definitely be in this space with us. And we had not just theater artists, but musicians and visual artists, projectionists. And it was a really beautiful gathering. I think we had about 70 people. And then in the afternoon, we did a bit of a a brainstorm and we asked people to just come up with ideas for arts-based actions around climate change and in particular we were coming up to a federal election in Canada at that time and we were really trying to tell the story of the climate has to be front uh, and center in this election because it's going to be a huge deciding uh, four years for us. And so we did this brainstorm we had everyone put this beautiful wall of sticky notes up and then we just broke out into groups and said okay find a group with a shared interest and let's start working on these projects and ideas. So after that day, which was in May 2019, we realized that we couldn't just ask everyone to kind of go out and autonomously work on these projects. We wanted to provide um, a platform and a resources for them to, to be supported in carrying out their projects. So we decided that every two weeks we would host what we called an open space, which was just we asked local theaters to donate some rehearsal space to us and we would open up the space and we provide, you know, tea and snacks in a, in a fun environment to be in. And you could just come and work on your project or if you weren't working on anything, you could just come and find out what others were doing and join them, find collaborators and brainstorm together. So um, up until and into the pandemic, we hosted these events every two weeks and it was, um, just a really enjoyable experience of community building and meeting like-minded people and doing creative projects. So we we found kind of two, two underlying principles that I'll just identify right now, which are one that we believe that the arts are such an important vehicle for imagining the world that we'd like to see. I know that sometimes it's easy in activism to get bogged down in being against things and protesting things. And it was important to us to balance that with how are, what is the world that we're actually imagining? and How can we live that out? How can we demonstrate it for people to feel engaged with it? And the other one was that the arts was a really great low barrier to entry way for people to get involved in activism. I know I'm not the biggest extrovert in the world. So showing up at a protest as my first activist event is really intimidating and it's, it can be hard to meet people. So we wanted to have this space where you could just come and you could maybe paint something or collage or be a part of something. 
Um, it's also a focus for us to collaborate with lots of the other fantastic progressive organizations in Toronto. And so we're able to connect in and say, okay, you're hosting this event, maybe we'll bring some kind of arts activation to it. Um, and that way we're able to activate artists and then send them out into the world to collaborate with, you know, the Migrant Rights Network or our local climate justice organization. Um, organizations supporting specifically Indigenous sovereignty and the land back movement. So that's been a big piece of it as well. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about our structure just in case you're thinking that you really want to go out and do a grassroots arts activist collective in your community, which would be great. Um, we try to be as non-hierarchical as possible. We're essentially just a community that likes to gather. We do have a, a coordinating committee that plans the events and controls our social media, but beyond that, you know, no titles and roles. Um, we want to really support autonomous projects. Anyone from the group that wants to bring forward an idea and say, I really want to do, you know, this performance art piece on the steps of City Hall, we want to just help them find the resources that they can go and carry it out autonomously and we can promote it for, through our channels uh, if they want us to, that kind of thing. And, and the, I'll just come back to the fact that the intersectionality of climate justice being connected to all forms of justice really underlies a lot of the work that we do as well. So I'll just give you a couple of quick examples before I pass it off to Daniel Sarah. I'm going to attempt to screen share a couple of photos. Here we go. Hopefully you're seeing that. Someone flag me if you're not. This one here, this is from that first event that we held. Uh, this is just right after our big brainstorm, so you can kind of see all the sticky notes on the wall off to the right, and that's our May Day. Uh, the second one that I'll share is a little bit, this is our probably our most famous uh, thing that we've done is create this pipeline puppet. So many of you climate informed folks will know that pipelines, especially in North America, are a really big climate issue. And in Canada, we're trying to stop exporting the oil from our tar sands. So we created this monster pipeline puppet. It has a really long oil slick tail that's, that uh, drags, <laughs> drags behind it. And we've done some different activations using this scary pipeline monster. Uh, here you're seeing we did an unjust wedding between uh, the pipeline and the settler state, which is why the pipeline's wearing a bridal veil. Uh, lots of great implications around um, gender and patriarchy with that as well. Um, this was for the climate march last year, but before that we did a different activation performance art piece where we basically built a big on off switch and we had the pipeline dance around menacingly scaring the crowd and try to goad the crowd into coming up and turning off the pipeline with the on off switch and eventually someone from the crowd comes up and turns it off and the pipeline dies a really dramatic death and you know it's a super simple piece it's really short and super silly but it actually really provides a great model I think for just engaging people in a crowd outside to really think about what does it feel like to have a win? What does it feel like to shut down a pipeline project? And it kind of creates this exciting jubilant atmosphere of solidarity in a crowd. So uh, that for me was just a really exciting moment. Um, I'll go quickly through my last two pictures here. This was another event that we were part of. Daniel Sarah really was the, the main creator of uh, was this protest. And this was a, in support of trans rights um, where there was a transphobic speaker at our Toronto Public Library. We had over a thousand community members show up in support of trans rights. And you can see they're all holding up books. We did a read in and we asked them to support trans non-binary and two-spirit authors by bringing books by trans writers. And they're, everyone's holding up their books and we literally just sat in the street and read these stories. And it was such a great example of living the world that we wanted to be in and uplifting the voices we wanted to uplift and not just putting the focus on the transphobic speaker who we were kind of just trying to, uh, to ignore. And lastly, here's some collage Valentines we did last year for the land back movement and for land defenders in so-called Canada, which is just, I wanted to share because it's an example of a small, easy artistic project and anyone that showed up that night was able to participate. And it's just an, a really accessible way to start talking about Indigenous sovereignty and, and the land back movement. Um, so while Daniel Sarah is performing, I can also share a couple of links in the chat to the different work of our, our collaborators at ACMGIS. And if anyone has questions later, I'd love to hear it. Please reach out to us. I'm happy to talk about the whole situation here in Toronto and Canada. Thank you so much.
Okay, Miss Sarah. Thank you so much, Kaylee, for that great summary of what we've been up to. And thank you to Taz and Geraldine for this, for the great hosting and to Becca and everybody else involved in organizing for, for bringing us in. It's such a pleasure. So uh, as, as was said, I am going to offer a, a lyric contribution. And initially I was going to uh, play some songs and then I, I, I you know, I'm pretty nervous about this because I'm, I'm mostly a writer and I, I sort of resurrected a music practice in the past uh, year, like in the sort of under the conditions of the pandemic, uh, as I guess many of us have have taken to new or resurrected old uh, ha habits and hobbies, for better or worse. So I've, I've resurrected my music uh, habits. Um, and so I'm going to split the difference and uh, play you one song and gamble that I it is not as rusty as I as I uh, fear it might be after nevertheless having sort of rehearsed it a bunch. Um, and I'm going to read you a, a poem uh, that and both of them are I think both both the song and the poem are thinking about um, the ways that exhaustion and uh, despair and these sort of like negative, like negative affect can can be um, sort of you know inevitably uh, bound up with the kind of work we do in service of liberation and how that's sort of okay in some ways and that we sort of need to find ways to or it's good if we can find ways to like integrate the sort of, you know, the whole of that experience um, that includes all kinds of, um, you know, difficulty and exhaustion and, and despair of sort of like the losses as well as optimism about the possibility of winning and so on. So um, yeah, so the song is called Keep Ups and then the poem, I'll like kind of lightly content warning it. It's like, it has some sort of uh, somewhat explicit sort of descriptions of uh, sexuality, queer sexuality. Um, and uh, pornography, but I mean, it's not sort of hi hyper explicit, but it sort of mentions um, pornography and stuff. Uh, so yeah, but I would play the song first. This is called Keep Ups. Excuse me a moment, I need to end empire, build secular cathedrals while I have the energy to. I have to do all of it all in this one breath before I lose steam, can't get moving and sleep for a month or two. raised a man I'd like to be small round off my edges if the world weren't full of thickets to be cut through and the sea is soft I dream of it I know you can sink or float edgeless unnamed but it's not a place where I can be with you Take your place 
so you can rest a while. Sarah, that was so beautiful. COVID was great for your music career. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. From my, within my wall of hair. So I'll just read this little poem um, in, uh, to complement that. It's quite short. Um, so this poem is called uh, Burrow. And uh, it was published last year in the Puritan magazine in, uh, in Canada. Burrow. Morning's a small dog I coax from my warm bed. And when your scent remains within my sheets, I want to keep that pup at bay until the seas concede to the red blooms of algae murdering sea life, inaugurating the sixth mass extinction to have cleansed this planet since it first was sullied by desires we might call creaturely. I call you, you don't answer. Blow me off next time I text. My cock, if that's the name that I'm now calling it, inside your mouth was like yours in my hand. I couldn't tell the difference. I would like to write a poem that offers what pornography, I mean porn at its best, can make me feel just good. Escape that maybe names but doesn't attempt to recuperate how unjust power produces what I want to come to, what I don't. A small dog wouldn't whimper half as much as I do when I feel how capsized I am before single body's beauty, even when I know collective beauty is more reliable, more ethical and needful now. If I invite the dog back to my bed and tuck us in, will we be suffered to just slumber for a while longer? Just a while, just for a little moment longer. Thanks. Thank you so much, Daniel Sarah. Again, amazing, two for one. Um, thank you so much for performing. You are absolutely wonderful. And also to Kaylee, I think that, you know, so much of the climate action movement is taught to be like boring and it's so important to inject fun into it and have fun in the process of activism. It's so, it's just so important or else it's, it's just not worth it, you know? And like sustainability doesn't have to be, you know, trousers made out of granola and just, you know, potato sack mm -hmm. dresses. <laughs> But um, yeah, it's great to see you injecting some fun and creativity. And, and drama. And drama. And the drama. <laughs> um, so thank you. Thank you both so much. Next up on our virtual stage, we have Nakisa Glover, who is an organizer with the Hip Hop ca ca Caucus campaign, Think 100%, which connects the hip hop community across the US to the political process by framing climate justice through podcasts, film, music and activism. Nikisa graduated with a degree in biology and works with many other environmental justice groups across the US, illustrating that by uniting science and art, we can create a more powerful climate music uh, movement. Really looking forward to this one, if you can take it away. Nikisa. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Um, my name is Nikisha Glover. Um, I'm here in Charlotte, North Carolina, um, across the ocean from you all. Um, I am the Think 100% organizer for Hip Hop Caucus, and I've been invited today to talk to you about the role of music in climate justice advocacy. Um, for us, music has a powerful role um, in which it empowers um, the cultural expression of communities who are first and worst impacted by injustice. So with that being said, I wanna uh, start by giving you a little bit of a background about Hip Hop Caucus, our work, and then I'll navigate into some of the um, 
some of the aspects of the work that we're actively engaging and working on. So first, um, let's break down uh, the name of our organization. Uh, it's called Hip Hop Pockets, but when you um, break it down, hip meaning current, pop meaning to move, and pockets meaning we do it together. Since 2004, Hip Hop Pockets has served to represent the hip hop community's interest and in policy that affects black and indigenous people of color communities in the United States. We use the power of our cultural expression to empower communities who are first and worst impacted by injustice. Our vision for racial justice, healthy communities, and a healthy planet fuels what we mean when we say all power to all the people. Our program areas include Respect My Vote. Um, Respect My Vote is the longest running, most successful hip hop voter engagement campaign ever. And since first launching the Respect My Vote um, campaign in 2008, we have worked with hip hop artists and influencers to register and educate tens of thousands of voters and help them get to the polls. We have engaged and reached tens of millions of voters with information and affirmative messages about voting. The other aspect of the work that Hip Hop Caucus does um, in our program areas is our Think 100% campaign. Um, and the Think 100% work, uh, we, we include under that umbrella of work, our Think 100% podcast, Think 100% film, think 100% music. Um, they all provide the infrastructure and the resources for creatives to use their talent to tell stories and shape narratives on climate justice that move people to action. Think 100% activism, it takes the stories and the content created by talented creatives of color and deploys it into campaigns that drive action for climate justice. A little bit more about Think 100%. Our Think 100% content and engagement platforms are for multicultural millennials and Gen Z who, are, who care about justice and our planet. We provide information about the climate crisis and solutions in a way that speaks directly to them. Think 100% is about justice, it's about solutions, and it's about realness. And it is not depressing. It is about our beauty of our world and the grit of fighting for our existence. It gives you life, it gives you energy, and it gives you inspiration. We have artists and entertainers, community leaders, entrepreneurs, politicians, and experts all helping to make Think 100% the coolest place in the climate movement. Think 100% provides an entry point, opportunities for ongoing engagement, and a voice and feel that is welcoming, relevant, and empowering, which turns the Think 100% audience into climate influencers, activists, and organizers within their own communities and networks. I wanna take a moment real quick because um, there'll be a point where I, I will want to actually walk through a couple of things with you that I will want my screen for. So give me a moment while I make sure I have that up and ready to go for us. Okay, so I've got that up and ready. Um, let's see. Okay. All right, so I wanna give you a little bit more about the history of um, Think 100% and that roadmap. Uh, Think 100% began as a campaign launched in 2016, and it really began to strengthen and formalize in February 2018 with the Think 100% podcast, where we launched season one of the coolest show on climate change in February of that year. Um, uh, in that season, we produced and released 43 hour-long episodes, and it is a masterclass on environmental and climate justice. Season two focused on young people and the elections. The show has been on the road and recording in, and we've done some recording in communities across the country, mobilizing young people to vote. Uh, with some, uh, the summer of 2019 and that launch that we did, um, we, it actually coincided with um, the 14th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina. And our theme at that time was young people will win. 
Um, so that's a little bit about like the history that's gotten us to this point. And as I spoke earlier, how we branched in branched out into um, beyond the podcast, into film, into music, and into activism as the um, body of work under Think One Hundred Percent. Um, so a little bit more about those uh, different areas under Think 100% brand. Um, I'm going to um, spend a little bit of time of talking to you about that. Um, one thing in particular with the podcast, we are preparing for our launch of season three, which will happen on Monday for the coolest show on climate where we will be featuring MacArthur Fellow, Catherine Coleman Flowers, and she is also the author of Waste, One Woman's Fight Against America's Dirty Secret, where she is exploring the environmental justice movement in rural America. Um, and so we invite you to uh, join. We invite you to join and listen in and participate with that as we uh, roll that out on Monday. Give me one second. I've got a couple of things on my screen. Okay. Um, so that is about the um, podcast, but then we also have um, our Climate Fridays, um, hashtag Climate Friday, where we produce a weekly radio broadcast on Pacifica radio station, WPFW 89.3 FM in Washington, D.C., the hour-long show hosted by Reverend Lennox Yearwood, Jr., um, our CEO and founder, features leading voices in climate justice and civil rights and keeps you up to date on breaking news, environmental issues, and the climate crisis and politics. Um, now, I'm really excited to share for you as well under our Think 100% Films brand. We are in the process of uh, releasing Ain't Your Mama's Heat Wave. And Ain't Your Mama's Heat Wave will premiere this environmental film festival in the world. The environmental film festival is um, being held in the nation's capital um, called DC Environmental Film Festival this March. I want to um, take a moment to actually show you a clip of what we have done um, to get you excited and I hope that you'll join us at film festival. Bringing kids in this world is scary. And I'm thinking about buying my boys a kayak, you know? <laughs> Can you imagine somebody taking a kayak to a shop and go? That's stupid. And I want to tell you just a report from these white climate crisis rooms, what they worry about. Straws, sea turtles, black people. <laughs> it's not a good order. I went to Howard, so I made my decision and stuck to it, okay? I just want to brag, though. Howard had a swim team. Y'all might want to get on top of that. Uh... I'm already crying. Then the police there. I'm calming down. Police walking. <laughs> They too used to shoots, man. They like, they walk me out to the car, they're like, hey, was, was it right here? I'm like, they still in the area. Why are you trying to get me to Takashi myself? So I braid hair too. Anybody, where the black women at in here? I feel a little self-conscious for saying it and my hair not braided, because people be like, oh, you braid hair, do you? Um... <laughs> a lot of beautiful black women in here, nice hair, but you gotta, you gotta watch those sea levels. If it get too high, everybody gonna have to go natural. <laughs> So with that clip, the power of joy as resistance is highlighted there. Um, and Ain't Your Mama and Seat Wave, it uplifts the resistance for all of us to be fed, fueled and ready to fight for climate justice. Joy is being used to navigate through pain. Ain't Your Mama's Heat Wave is the first stand-up comedy special to appear in DC's Environmental Film Festival's history and is bringing an innovative voice to the festival's lineup, as you can see. At a time of intersecting global crises, environmental films and stories can weigh heavily on audiences. We are absolutely thrilled to bring critical 
critique of the climate crises and racial injustice to the festival audience in a format that brings laughter and joy. Black storytelling about the climate crisis by Black creatives and the Black communities has been overlooked by environmentalists, the media, and Hollywood. The inclusion of Ain't Your Mama Seat Wave at the largest environmental film festival in the world signals the shift to correct a historic muting of environmental injustice in Black communities. Filmed at the historic Attics Theater as a part of its centennial celebration, Ain't Your Mama Seat Wave is a his hilarious and truthful stand-up comedy in the tradition of Black art tied to Black struggle for freedom and liberation. And with that being said, I just want to highlight for you all that not only do we have this comedy special that is premiering um, in March at the festival, we are also in the works with a subsequent documentary. Um, so be on the lookout for that under our Think 100% Films brand. Um, as far as Think 100% Music, um, you can find our home album. Um, you can find our home album, um, Heal Our Mother Earth is what it stands for, um, where we actually um, pull together artists who are using their creative talent to uplift the climate crisis and the problem. Um, and also talk about the solutions. So that's something else that you can be out on the lookout for. And I do wanna note that I'm giving y'all a lot of information. I have all the links compiled for you. So as soon as I get through speaking, I'm gonna drop all the links for you uh, where you can find the information speaking to. Um, as far as Think 100% Music, again, recording artists and musicians are looking for ways to lend their voices and platforms to the movement and for uh, voter participation. Think 100% Music is cultivating the leadership of these artists and coordinating nonpartisan strategies for music releases to drive young people to engage online, in the field, and at the voter, bo voter booth. And lastly, of those uh, those total of four things, um, four um, compartments of Think 100%, there's Think 100% Activism, um, where we focus in and we're tuning into climate justice and democracy. Think 100% Activism maintains a dual force on driving change through policy advocacy and democracy through pressure on the financial system. Clean air and water and its impact on public health are a top environmental concern for communities and are important ways to relate to voters about the climate crisis. Think 100% maintains a strong focus on public health impacts of dirty air and water on African-American, Latinx, and indigenous communities, as well as the Think 100% and Hip Hop Caucus long-term focus on environmental justice and impacts of fossil fuel extraction and community exploitation from fracking to pipelines. So as I begin to close, we are broadening and growing a climate movement powerful enough to solve the climate crisis. A majority of America, 53%, now live in a household with high multicultural influence. In reality, that what was once considered multicultural um, is now mainstream. In the US, 42% of millennials are people of color and 48% of Gen Z are people of color. Public opinion research shows multicultural millennials and Gen Z overwhelmingly believe climate science and support climate action, as we all know, at higher rates than their white peers and older generations. Race is the tripwire of the environmental movement a weakness that the fossil fuel industry is exploiting. And by broadening the climate movement to build unbeatable power, it is our mandate. And in 2021, it is we are set to have a breakthrough year. Um, so in closing, those uh, links I'm gonna drop for you. Um, again, join us at the DC Environmental Film Festival and watch your and watch Ain't Your Mama's Heat Wave. Um, vote for us also for the Audience Award when they release the opportunity to vote. Um, I want you all to also listen to the coolest show on climate um, where we're uh, launching season three on Monday. Listen to hashtag Climate Friday and follow us on our social media channels at Hip Hop Caucus. And our website is think100climate.com for more information about Think 100% or 
or you can go to hiphoppodcast.org um, for more information as well. And we do have an impact report on our website as well. So I want to thank you for your time. It's still daylight where I'm at. If you're curious about what time it is, it's about four o'clock in the afternoon here. But I want to thank you so much for um, joining me um, and the opportunity to talk about Think 100% and the relationship between music and, and create in our culture. Woo! Thank you so much, Nikita. God, I'm just in awe of how you managed to galvanize so many people in your community. And I love your approach in terms of, I feel, I feel like you're kind of like hitting people where their, their interests are. I mean, like podcasts, I love podcasts, C comedy, like who doesn't love a bit of comedy? And by using that as a way to kind of hone in on the, the climate justice, I suppose, movement and to kind of bring people on board. I think it's such a clever way to do it. Um, I also love the sound of the, uh, the cool show on climate. So I will definitely be tuning in on Monday. Um, God knows I've got nothing else to be doing. We're here in lockdown in Ireland. So um, lots of time for podcasting. So I'll definitely be tuning in. So thank you so much again. Really, really enjoyed that. So I suppose from Nas Massachusetts to the Netherlands, we're going to be moving on to our next speaker. And that is Emma Nomina, who is the CEO of Wise with Waste. So Emma seeks to improve waste management facilities and social prospects for women and young people in Madagascar. So um, in, uh, in Madagascar, in the Maldives and in India. So she is currently undertaking a PhD investigating bioplastics in the Netherlands. So in, with waste management existing as a climate disparity between um, communities and countries, we will hear how the two intersect and can be targeted for better growth. So Emma, if you'd like to come on and join us on our virtual stage. Okay. Nikita, I might just have to ask if you wouldn't mind unsharing your screen. And then we can see you, Emma. Can you hear me too? Yes, yeah, we, we can. can. I'm working on it. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> I think if you click it, oh, there yeah, we are. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you Brilliant. so much. So take. Okay. Well, thank you very much uh, for this nice introduction. Um, I am very grateful to have been invited to this panel because I feel like when it comes to climate and inequality, there is just so much that people don't know, lay people, even though environmentalists have been working for a long time in trying to really raise awareness about these issues and trying to find solutions for them. Uh, so um, as, um, as was said before, I'm Emma, I originally come from Madagascar, and uh, if you don't know where Madagascar is, it's this uh, island next to Africa. Many people know uh, Madagascar by the movie Madagascar, or maybe by Vanilla, which comes from Madagascar, or Ylang Ylang. And uh, for most people who meet me, I'm the first person uh, from Madagascar that they have met in their entire life, so they often ask me, what is it like to live in Madagascar? And um, I always never know how to answer that question because it's it's such a loaded question. Um, I don't think I represent the average experience of a Malagasy person, but also life in Madagascar for me has changed so much through my entire life. And the life of my grandparents has not been the same as the life of my parents and not be the same as my own life, which has been also very different from the life of my little brother. Um, so um, speaking about my grandparents, they were farmer, farmers in Madagascar. We live in the highlands. They were uh, farming rice like the majority of uh, the Malagasy population. And um, my grandparents love to talk about the good old days where they were able to have these huge paddies of rice and these cows and these chickens in, in their um, fields and how they were able to raise their um, I think 12 children on just their rice field and time, time was great. And then over the time, they found out that it was getting harder and harder for them to cultivate rice. For example, there would be like huge rainfalls for like months and months. And then afterwards followed by intense drought where basically all the, no water came at all. And rice is a very intense, water intensive crop. So for them, it was basically like, all, all, all the entire year's work was basically gone because of that. And uh, it used to be like maybe it would happen once every decade, but then it kept happening again and again. And uh, they were really puzzled as to why that is. And um, my grandparents, they are not really scientists. I am a scientist, but um, they really have, I think they have much more knowledge than me in how things work. They are able to just look at the sky and look at those clouds and be like, oh, it's going to rain now. It's going to be wind coming from this side. It's really like what, what you would call indigenous knowledge. 
of um, nitrate free qualifiers in the genus ourselves. Um, so then um, they relied on those principles to grow everything and everything was fine for a very long time. And then all of a sudden, nothing worked anymore. And they were kind of wondering what happened. Uh, well, now, of course, we know what has happened. It's uh, climate, the climate crisis. Uh, but it's funny because in Madagascar, we don't say climate crisis. We, we call it a broken climate. And I think it's very fitting because for people like us, like my grandparents who don't really have a degree in science, all you can see is just what's happening before your eyes. So when you see that things worked before and now they don't work, it's broken. Um, so then um, my grandparents came to know about the climate crisis um, and then my parents all, of course, um, listened to their story and they were like, oh yeah, it's hard. So but what my parents did was move to the city where uh, they were able to find better jobs that did not rely on agriculture. So then we moved to the capital city in Madagascar, Tananarive, and um, there actually it was much harder because in the capital city, it's far away from the coast that you don't really get any like, drought or any big, any, any um, huge fall, rainfall. But when you have cyclones, then it's really bad because it really gets uh, to the capital city and it can cause a lot of damage. It's basically like a, a huge rainstorm. And I remember when I was, I think I was eight or nine years old, I, um, there was these alarms everywhere that you should stay home because of heavy winds, because the cyclone was approaching the coast of Madagascar and very rapidly coming onto the highlands. And uh, for me, as a kid, I really didn't know what happened, but I know that my parents were very panicked in what to do, what we're going to deal with this. And um, our house was, uh, was, was, was very modest. It was just a normal house with a, um, um, how do you call it, like this, the steel, roofs on top so it's not like tiles but just like pieces of sheets of metal on top of the roof so then the government was like um you have to put bags of sand onto your rooftop otherwise it's going to blow away and kill someone so then but what my parents did was of course you could not work because there were like so much wind that you could not even get out of your house the roads were muddy it's not like asphalt roads it's just like basically mud and um, we just stayed home and we took as much sand as we could and as much dirt as we could from the backyard. We filled them up and we put them onto a roof. Of course, as a kid, I was like, it was very exciting for me. It was something new to do during the day. And it was like fun to transport the bags up onto the roof so nothing would blow away. Uh, but um, now that I look back on it, it's really a very frightening experience to be in because what good parents would do is try to know you make a game out of it and make sure that the kid doesn't panic because they themselves were panicking. But um, it was a very frightening situation. The winds were blowing. They didn't know if the house would survive. If it blew away, what would happen? The electricity were shut off, so there was no way of communication. No one was on the streets because everyone was inside. And um, um, one of the neighbors later told me that uh, one of their mothers actually had her the the top of her head sliced off because of a tile that has evaporated, that has been blown away by the winds. So um, it's it's it really was a scary situation to be in. But somehow for us, it just became normal life because as those things happened again and again, you just you just do it. You know, every three years you put bags of sand onto your roof and you wait it out and then you survive. Um, I know that my little brother used to say that, oh yeah, we we do that all the time. Like it's like a Malagasy tradition, but actually no, it is not. It is actually something that we had to do to adapt to the climate crisis because all the cyclones become, were becoming more frequent and frequent. I think two years ago, there were actually three within a year, which is really insane when you think of it. So you, you cannot do anything because everything is just ravaged. You rebuild it and then another one comes and blows everything away. Um, so that was really um, how it was in Madagascar, at least until um, I left to pursue studies in the global north. And then the funny thing is that people in the global north don't really have the same perception of the climate crisis. I think at the time it was called global warming. So then when I would talk about my experience with the cyclones in Madagascar and I would ask them, like, do you have cyclones here? They were like, uh, no. Uh, and uh, I would tell them about my experience and they would say like, oh yeah, well, it's probably a global warming, it's just the weather in your country. And I would ask them like, really, are you sure? And they would say, well, yes, well, don't you remember we had a lot of snow last year, so it can't be global warming. Um, and at the time, I don't think the science was really clear on what was 
what, what it was. There were like very multiple nomenclatures about global warming, climate crisis, climate change, and there were all, there was also not a lot of awareness around what was happening in the general public. So for me, at least, I felt very slighted because I had this experience and I knew what was happening, but people were not willing to listen. And um, fast forward a few years later, uh, with Greta Thunberg really making um, making a lot of noise in the world, people started to realize what was happening. But um, I felt like there was something off in the way that people were perceiving climate change. Um, and this is not to say anything negative about Greta Thunberg. I think she has done a lot of great work in raising awareness, but there is somehow this perception that the environmental um, movement is a very white movement that you can only participate in. If, if you have, only if you have money, if you're middle class, generally a woman, then that's really when you can do the most work in this movement. And that is really so wrong. And this is very wrong for many reasons that was explained by the other panelists, but also if you think about it, only most people of color are going to experience climate change in some way or another, maybe not as harsh as I did, maybe even worse, maybe less. But um, when white people talk about the experience with the climate crisis, this tends to be something distant in the future. It's called Friday for the future. It's called um, building a better world for their children and grandchildren. Whereas people like me are already suffering right now or even in the past already. So. What, what do you make of that? Is it really for the future? Is it for the people now? And uh, I felt that there, there was this weird thing that was happening where there was this, um, I will call them white environmentalists that were talking about building something for the future, improving sustainability and everything. And then these other environmentalists that were really focusing on building their community, making their, making their communities more resilient, helping them really achieve something that um, makes their community more stronger against climate change and trying also to inform other people in the global north that um, they are in the majority causing climate change, so they have to do something about it. And I, I feel like this huge inequality between the two different movements, which, you know, in the end, we want the same thing, but we approach it in different ways that don't really solve the problem, is something that I've really had to struggle within this movement. Um, a few weeks ago, I was also um, talking to other scientists, climate scientists, um, working in Germany, and they were talking to me about uh, their approach to um, mitigating climate change and what they should do, especially because they wanted to implement something in Madagascar. And they were talking about climate migration. And in my view, climate migration is like really the last resort. It's like if you cannot do anything else, well, then you have to move somewhere else and then you'll be safe from, from climate change. But um, although in theory it would work for people like me in Madagascar, we have really strong ties to our hometown. I think in English you say home country or hometown, but in um, in Malagasy it's called Tanjazan, which means the land of your ancestors. So when you are there in your hometown, everything basically revolves around that hometown because you do all your rights there, everything around birth, death, wedding, all happens there because that is where you have built your community. And especially in those communities, we tend to help each other out, as opposed to the more individualistic um, ways of people in the global, global north. So, for example, my grandparents grew rice, but the neighbor next door, they had um, more cows and more chicken, and the other ones had more vegetables and more fruit. So then at the end, we would like pull everything together and share between us so we could have a good nutritious meal. That's that's how it works, how we, how we are from. But then those climate scientists, basically, they were like, okay, we're going to move these people here and then these people over there and these people over there without really taking into account that we have really deep social ties to where it come from. So when you break down all these communities, basically everything stops functioning because, um, because we have all the synergies that allow us to really come together, come stronger together. And when you break those, everything collapses. Also, it is problematic because of another aspect. For example, those people in those colder cities who tend to be very, very much affected by those cyclones and the, dr the drought and the rain. Um, I'll take the example of Tomas, which is a port city in Madagascar. And it tends to be uh, to have a lot of disparity in terms of um, just of incomes because there are those rich businessmen who are doing business at the port or bringing in lots of money. They tend to be um, more um, 
let's say middle class or upper class, they tend to be foreigners maybe. And those really are really like the, the wealthier parts of the city. And then there are the others who are low income workers um, who are you know basically just making a living day to day, living day to day. So um, when it comes to migration, of course, those people who are richer, they are able to move to a different part. They can just sell their villa, sell their house, move somewhere else that is safer. But those who come from low income backgrounds, they of course cannot move because it will be very difficult for them to find another place that might be more expensive than where they are. Because, you know, if you live in a, an area that is very dangerous, of course, it's going to be cheaper. Um, it's going to be very difficult for them to establish new ties in that city to find jobs even. And if you are a woman, oh, God help you if you are a woman, because if you, uh, Madagascar is still a very patriarchal, patriarchal country where being a woman is weird kind of a, I want to say disadvantage, but maybe you don't really get a voice when you're a woman and you get less choices, I would say. So if you're a woman trying to, trying to navigate that environment where you have to be migrated somewhere else, then you might end up feeling less safe in that new environment that you were previously where you have established your community. So really, you can see that even within Madagascar, which is a fairly homogeneous country, I would say there are still deep inequalities that make everything related to the climate crisis even more um, exacerbated because of gender, because of, um, because of wealth, basically, how you're born and who you're born from can really dictate your life. And there is something that is very, very unfair about that. The scientists, they told me, well, this is a theory and it would work in principle. How do you think we can make it better? I think my only response uh, that day was, uh, well, it's not fair, but um, it, it's not fair. And you have to really think about how to make it fairer because the climate crisis is in just in you know, of itself. But you cannot make it even more unjust by having these huge disparities by not really taking into account those injustices, if that makes sense. Um, um, so I'm mindful of time, so I think this is a good time to stop. Uh, but um, I think by now I would, I would have convinced you that there is a very big disparity between the, how we think about the climate crisis in the global north and the global south, but also at localized regions, because you really have to take intersectionality into account. And intersectionality is so, so, so important when you think about such a big issue as the climate crisis. If it was only a single issue, we would have solved it by now, but of course not. It's very complex. You have to tackle it from multiple angles and think about so many different parameters, social and economic parameters in order to make it work and to make it fair for everyone. So um, usually when I talk to people about climate injustice, they ask me, well, they tell me, well, that's, that's, that's sad, but what can we do? And I flip the question around to tell them, what do you think we should do? And don't think about it in terms of the law, in terms of what the government is able to do now. Think about what the government, what we should actually do to make it morally the right action to take. And even that, if that's a small action, I encourage you to really take that because Really, if all of us take a small action, we might get to something much bigger than if just one person takes a huge, huge, huge action to solve everything. Thank you very much. So well said. So well, that was amazing, Emma. So insightful, genuinely. And I think it's always, it's always, it's always great to be reminded, say for us who are living in Ireland, that you know, climate change may not seem seem like the most imminent threat to us, but it is happening right now in communities all over the world. And much like what you touched on, like the reason that we are sitting pretty in Ireland right now and aren't really experiencing climate change so much compared to communities that are being forced to migrate because of climate change is luck. Like the, the luck is the reason there, you know. And it's also so interesting that you were saying that, you know, back home it's it's more so called broken climate as opposed to climate change and that's so true because it's not the climate isn't changing it's crisis the climate crisis the broken it's a broken climate you know so really really enjoy that and, and took so much from it so thank you so much Emma now zoom crew it's hard to believe that we've reached the final performer of the night no but we but at last we have and it is a very good it's a nice it's a it's a nice a nice ending I believe um Dublin-based musician Layla Jane Keeney explores emotion and calls for self-reflection and better acknowledgement for each other and for nature she will be performing a connection of three songs look away from our cre from our creation which reflects on leaders climate denial and in inhibiting ability to act based on the crisis being 
too mighty to tackle, poison which embodies gender inequality and the abuse of bias and stereotypes that permeate within society, and finally flame game which explores how consumption in the current economic system has created a disconnect between people and their, pl their planet state. Just before um, we kick off with Leila Jane, um, could we just say that there's going to be a Q&A at the end of this and everyone's welcome to join. So if you would like to input any questions that we can ask our panellists, um, you can do so in the Q&A box at the bottom. But uh, sorry, aside from that, Leila Jane, take it away. Hello, hello. I hope you can hear me. Um, thank you for that introduction, Taz and Geraldine. I'm really just so inspired to be here and I... Yeah, I feel really good about watching everyone and, and hearing um, just that there's so much diversity and, and to this issue. And um, I guess where I'm coming from is that for me, I've, I felt like the past while in order f for me to be a positive impact on the environment and everything, I had to first kind of get real with myself and like you know, um, get real with my emotions and, and everything. And I think a big part of what will definitely help is people kind of being honest with themselves about their experiences and tapping into, um, yeah, getting real with themselves and working from the inside out and in being more in tune with nature. And I often, the more I get more in tune with myself, I feel like nature has so many metaphors that kind of c you can relate to and and it just keeps trying to nudge us in the right direction um but anyway um i find that i can express myself much more succinctly with my songs so i'm going to play my three songs that there's three of them so i'm going to do them back to back and the first one is flame game and it's just sort of yeah here it is, um, yeah, flame game. <laughs> Don't 
won't be afraid Have no fear Cause they don't know how to love The way you do, my next song is called Poison. If I see it again, I won't be alarmed. I'll know just what to do. And I will let him get off so easy And I won't let him slip away so coolly Violation mixed with love It's an evil poison like a drug, oh yeah And you get Get away with it, don't 
Nice to be gigging again. Um. This next song is called Look Away from Our Creation and kind of explains itself. I mean, there was a long description there, but it's basically about how we prefer to look away from what we've created uh destruction wise and and stuff so uh here it is oh something doesn't feel right something doesn't feel right Something doesn't feel right Swain Like the mess I've become Side to side Won't somebody please run And tell the world How bad it feels But they won't let me down here Yes, I think they'd rather that I disappear Look away, look away from my creation Try not to see what we've become It's just a hideous reflection Let's keep on living like he's gone He's an animal The furniture is cold Just open a window And let yourself grow old Nobody around here is asking why Have you learned anything or will you just let it die Oh, treat yourself to something nice Try not to look him in the eye Look away, look away from my creation Try not to see what we've become He's just a hideous reflection Let's keep on living like he's gone We've become 
It's just a hideous revelation Let's keep on living like he's gone Let's keep on living like he's gone Thank you. Woo! Oh, wow. That was absolutely gorgeous. I feel like every person watching that, uh, that performance is like, hmm, I might get myself a guitar. Maybe I could be as good. <laughs> um, definitely inspired to try to give it a go, but uh, beautiful music. So thank you so much for that. Thank you. And it was lovely to have uh, have you perform perform for our final feature of the night, um, going out out with a bang. Um, but I suppose just want to say thank you to all all the performers and panelists who joined us this evening. I think it was a real gorgeous night of passion. Yeah, um, passion for sure. Mm, yeah, in the form of spoken word and storytelling and music and film. Um, so thank you so much, everyone. The the plan was to have a big big old um, Q and A and discussion after. We're probably a little bit behind time, so we won't have quite as much time as we had planned for. But that's fine. We can still ask um, a few crucial questions that we've had um, written in from um, our lovely audience who've been watching this evening. Also, yes, thank you so much for everyone who tuned in. I know. Um, it can be quite tiring watching on Zoom all day, every day. Um, so really appreciate you tuning in and also, of course, the Environmental Society for organising this. Fair play, Absolutely. really, really Such fantastic. Such a great event. event. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and uh, obviously all the panellists as well. And thanks for sticking around until the end. Such insightful causes and just insightful approaches to th this climate crisis and tackling climate justice so really really was amazing and we hope that you enjoyed it as much as we did yeah so you might just ask everyone if you wanted to turn on your videos and we can have a few chats so we've got a question coming in here from an anonymous attendee Ooh, mysterious. <laughs> Ooh, um, and this an anonymous attendee is asking a question specifically of you artists amongst yourselves do you feel creating helps you cope with climate anxiety or make you feel more concerned we might start with you tj <laughs> uh, yeah um it does a lot to me um for me i see it as a form of healing and despite healing communities, myself, it becomes a great healing process for me. I'm looking at how, um, and you know, um, my work deals with, um, I'm inspired by a symbol called Adink um, Sankofa. And Sankofa is one of the symbols in the Adinkra uh, symbols, which have its migration from Ivory Coast through Ghana and spread worldwide. And the concept of Sankofa is, um, seeking inspiration from the uh, from the past for your future. So this process alone, to me, is what helps me in the process of healing myself and thinking more about the anxiety of what is happening. Because constantly I'm thinking of, you know, like healing myself and then also encouraging myself to do something that would inspire generation and that begins to heal myself in terms of that yeah brilliant yeah. thank you so much and we, we might um we might ask that same question to um to who will we ask it to Geraldine maybe put your hand up in the air if you find that you are more inspired and feeling more hopeful through your music and your and that you feel maybe your community is responding in a more positive way or maybe and then yeah so yeah exactly okay okay let's who will we hear from first yeah I think it took away Katie you had your, oh, sorry, no, did you? Okay, sorry, we'll, just, we'll start with Katie. Sorry, our videos are- oh, I, I just wanted to express agreement, but I'd love to hear what some of the other artists have to say. Yeah, yeah for sure, maybe okay. Matambe? Matambe, sorry. Yeah, I, I find that like with that, it, it's kind of all this, like doing, doing projects such like this have, just like these have kept me motivated and more aware with, with everything that's going on right now with the COVID and stuff, it's great to actually, keep yourself inspired in working towards fixing other problems that are going on other than just COVID, you know? Mm. So I found that like this event for me definitely got me thinking, how can I actually start making an impact myself as an artist, which got me outside, even though we have a bit of like a, a distance to like work with, we can't really go really that far out of our boundaries, but we can still make do with what's around our environment so far. That's what's kept me motivated 
yeah. as an artist really like getting engaged in such activities such as this you know it's probably like a new sense of like resourcefulness as well because we're, we're so limited in like how much we can travel where mm-hmm. we can go what we can do you know you have to like approach your art in a different way yeah exactly. so I- Another question that came in was, and it was just a general question, I suppose, to the all the panelists was: Was there any specific moment that sparked your interest in, I suppose, the climate justice movement? So maybe you might ask Nakicha. Is that TJ? No, sorry, Nakicha. Okay. <laughs> sorry, excuse me, TJ again. <laughs> And let me see, that question again was, was there any specific moment that yeah. sparked my interest in climate justice? Um, I, I really appreciate that question um, because like, as far as like my training, um, I actually majored in biology, I minored in chemistry, I minored in African-American studies. And when I did that, like that was not a conscious decision of how I would use all those um and those uh, backgrounds together. But what's beautiful about that and also the different um, quote unquote lives that I've lived because climate justice is not like the first thing that I came out of school doing. I've been in insurance, I've been um, an entrepreneur, I've been in so many different spaces. Um, but, and, and I actually um, worked in a lab for a period of time. But what the thing about climate justice for me um, is that it's, all connected. Um, There's nothing that any of us are doing um, right now at this moment that is not connected to climate and climate justice. Um, It's all connected. And I'll tell you, like, the the thing that, like, really sealed it for me um, was, um, well, two things. One, is getting the um, language, language being so important. And I think that's something special about artists and storytellers that we're doing. together with on the stage today is that the ability to translate the message of climate is so important and getting that understanding that climate is not just weather and weather, um, the way that we experience weather. Um, Climate by definition is the condition of, it's the condition of, um, it's the condition of the land, the air, the water, and the people. And so we've all talked about political climate. We've all talked about education climate, right? So it's not an isolated conversation. When we talk about climate, these things are all connected. So that's the first spark. And then the last, like the other spark for me that just like really nail like how all these things that seem like um, very many um, dots along a very non-linear path that I've had um, was I was attending the National Adaptation Forum um, here in America um, a couple of years ago. And at that particular forum, Denise Fairchild was speaking and she was speaking in particular about um, the National Flood Insurance Program here. And that's when it clicked with me because I had kind of sort of siloed off my insurance um, world separate from um, what I know around um, my work around climate justice at that point. But hearing her speak about the National Flood Program, it clicked and was like, oh, it's like all of the conversations come together. It's just about having the language to be able to translate it in a way that resonates with the way in which we see the issues manifesting in our daily lives. So thank you for that question. No, I totally hear you as well, because I mean, I think it was the same for us. We didn't, as we already said, like we didn't come out of the womb with placards saying like sustainability, justice now or anything like that. So it was definitely a learning curve. And I I mean, the irony being that uh, like my kind of entry point into the sustainability movement was through sustainable fashion. Before I got into sustainable fashion, I was actually working for a women's fashion magazine. So that whole that whole business model was promoting the kind of consumerism that I'm like trying to rage against now. So uh, I totally hear you by saying like it's kind of so many twists and turns to this this um, position now within the climate justice movement. So um, really interesting. I always think though to to hear where people co- came from to to this point because Absolutely. it does cover so many areas and, and usually people are coming from so many different perspectives and point starting points. And yeah. so actually, I'd love to maybe ask the exact same question to Nim because I feel like you know you were talking a lot about the kind of history historical background as well of in, intersectionality and and diversity and yeah. um, I suppose justice in that respect. But did you come at this from specifically a historical maybe perspective was that was that where your expertise lay, lay or was it just an interest or a specific moment fill us in, fill us in. 
I think it was, I was reflecting with this question actually, and it was an interesting thought experiment for me because I think, I think when I first consciously was like becoming politicized was when I was around 15, 16, when 9-11 happened. Um, and then the kind of wake of 9-11, the Iraq war. So I was at school when in London, there was the, the huge uh, anti-Iraq war march over a million people turned out for and at the same time it was actually interesting because I was thinking I was studying history and politics and I had an Irish um, history and politics teacher who put um, Irish history and politics into our curriculum which um, I'm sure I don't have to tell any of you England doesn't like talking about its relationship to colonialism and islands. <laughs> I, it wasn't until I was much older that I realised how unique it was that like that was put on my curriculum at that point in my life and I think um I think I was kind of like growing a political awareness uh alongside kind of a historical analysis but I would not consciously at that point it was more just like what I was absorbing and then um went to university in from East London to Edinburgh um and so for anybody who doesn't know Edinburgh is like very or Edinburgh University in particular is a very like white middle class quite posh and it was a real culture shock but I didn't understand that at the time and it was there that I got into like climate activism and I think I just really internalized like there's something wrong with me because I couldn't relate to spaces to activism to climate in the way that like everybody else seemed to be and I think I just internalized that and then slowly I grew like a racial a kind of analysis of like my race, my class and actually how that was shaping how I was uh, how I was feeling different in that space. And so um, and then alongside that other things were happening like um, the financial crash happened and austerity became the like defining political strategy. Um, and um I think all of those things combined I think I started to look for answers in some way and so like it was kind of like through experiencing that through my own personal experience having access to like different thought and ideas um, and being in the process of doing activism I think all of it together I started to kind of be like hang on a minute like these things don't feel disconnected to me and when we're turning up as environmental like, like I was this was the time of when climate camps first started in the UK um, and I saw I was at climate camps from I can't remember when the first I think it was 2005 the first one was which um, followed on from the Glen Eagles protest in, outside Edinburgh um, and then they ran for another seven or eight years and um, I just remember those spaces feeling so alienating <laughs> and then also kind of just starting to question after a couple of years like what's the actual strategy here like why are we turning up so for anybody who doesn't know the climate camps were like big protests um where people would come and camp for a week they'd be skill sharing um workshopping together and then a big mass action and so they'd be at a site of environmental um destruction power stations um, and things and so there'd be a big mass action at the end of the week and I remember just thinking like, the workers hate us. Of course they hate us. Like, what's the strategy here? Like, why aren't, like, why are people turning up for a week and taking this big mass action with no connection to the community around here? Or like, what the, like who's impacted by this action? Who's impacted by shutting down this power station or whatever it is? Um, and so I think it was like, there wasn't, um, I think the question was like, was there a moment that sparked it? Or I don't think there was a moment. I think it was yeah. like living through different things and kind of piecing them all together slowly. Yeah, it's so interesting. It's like, even when I try to think back, it, it's it's never just one moment. And it's kind of like, you're in the depths of it before even realizing you're like, wow, now I'm I'm in this, you know? And like, it, it, it's not like a light switch where it's like, right now I am an advocate. It just yeah. <laughs> um, So I think like the next the next question I'd like is to Lisa. Um, as kind of like a filmmaker, I, I'd like to hear your opinion on this one because it's kind of, it's, it's believed that the sustainability movement, the climate action movement has a bit of an accessibility problem. You know, it, it can be quite difficult for people to engage with it if they feel like, you know, they're not of the scientific ability or the political ability or whatever it may be. They don't have the knowledge in those kind of, you know, it, it, like education wise or, you know, they, they feel like they're just not, it, the space isn't for them. Do you feel that like through the likes of film and podcast, it can bring everybody together 
more and just uh, make it more accessible for kind of like the ordinary person to get involved. Absolutely. Um, I think that with the advent of, you know, cell phones and much cheaper equipment, I mean, you know, people used to use film. It used to cost them thousands of dollars. I know this sounds ridiculous, but people used film, you know. When my partner, Alan, first started making films, he was using real film, you know. He had to have the, that was an enormous expense. So I think it's become much more egalitarian in that anybody can make a film. They can make a film on their phone, you know? And um, I think that that's wonderful because diverse voices are what we need to hear in this world now. I'm um, a member of an extraordinary film co-op that's been around for almost 50 years. It's called New Day Films and it's it, members from all across the country, um, hundreds of us and um, it's, you know, our, our, our push has been lately about diversity and we're really doing well within our ranks. That is act, act, actively recruiting um, BIPOC people of color um, and different ethnicities and um, sexual orientations. Um, it's been um, very exciting. And the, the films that people are coming into the co-op with are really important films dealing with um, transgender issues in the tenderloin in San Francisco, people being kicked out of their housing. And um, that film is called Tender. Um, just, um, I, I think it's, I think podcasts and um, the accessibility of making a film, you don't need to be a filmmaker. You know, you, I mean, I myself actually became a filmmaker by doing it. Um, I, I didn't go to film school and I brought to it my interest in actually colonialism, which the taking root is very much based in the context of colonialism, that film, um, because that was what destroyed the environment there in the first place. And obviously not just in Kenya, but all over that continent. So, um, you know, I, I, um, I lost my train of thought, but, um, it's great. Yeah. I think that, um, it's become a much more equal playground, you know, playing field. And that's only good. Yes, absolutely. And very quickly, Lisa, is there any one particular piece of film or documentary that you've seen that touches on the topics, one of the topics that has been discussed today, whether it's colonialism or climate chaos or, you know, anything along those lines that you'd recommend us to look out for? Oh, let's see. Um, Oh, that's a really good question. I can come back I, to you for that if you, if you yeah, want. Yeah, I can put it in the, I'll, I'll think yeah. about it. I'll, I'll, and I can put it in the chat also. Yeah, yeah I just, um, something, nothing's coming to mind right away. But Nakisa, I'm looking forward to seeing your film. Pardon? Nakisa, I'm looking forward to seeing that film. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah Nakisha's film. Yeah, yeah, she's muted. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, yes. oh, oh, sorry, no, go. <laughs> no, I was just saying thank you for the um, compliment. Um, we're excited about the film. Um, I think it's pretty powerful um, the way that we're able to translate um, the message and the themes that we're all talking about here today and we're doing it through comedy. So thank you for that. Can't wait to see it. <laughs> Um, the next question, I suppose, I might ask to our friends that are across the pond, um, Daniel, Sarah and Kaylee, and wondering what you are kind of hopeful for, if you are hopeful for anything right now, because <laughs> you guys have been, you know, mobilizing large groups of people to get involved. So is there anything you're hopeful for? Have you experienced hope in the last few months? What form did that hope come in? Please tell we us. We need hope. We're in another lockdown in Ireland. We need any hope we can find. So maybe Daniel, Sarah. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think that the the hope that I have has to do with shifting what passes for common sense, uh, I think, in our communities away from, I mean, when, when we started Akam just like, uh, I guess, you know, what, two, almost two years ago. Wow. That's like a, a year ago that was the pandemic. So it feels like no one. Yeah, you know, but, um, but yeah, when we, when we started that like two years ago, I think like one of my real motivating um ideas you know which also had been like a, a long-term sort of interest of mine was to create a space that would be a sort of political home for people who felt alienated by the kind of um you might say like hegemonic liberalism that sort of is the norm in a lot of our art institutions here that sort of don't really have any 
don't really have any critical sort of account of capitalism or imperialism or settler colonialism in a deep way, um, you know, and so and are, are sort of part of the kind of like liberal or neoliberal consensus. And I mean, that's like true of a lot of our kind of mainstream and legacy arts institutions that have shaped a lot of the common sense of artists and, you know, patrons of the arts and whatever, uh, you know, audiences in Canada, I think in a pretty sort of intense, intense way. I mean, Canada is really a place where um, I think even even like compared to somewhere like the United States, there's like there's a bit no outside to the center. Our, our sort of tendency to kind of push towards consensus means that like the way the liberalism exists here is like really intense. There's so much like sort of, you know, different kinds of denial um, around our sort of ongoing genocidal relationship to our sort of the indigenous people who um, were the original caretakers of this territory and still, you know, sort of have sovereignty on this territory. Um, and so I think just sort of like shifting what passes for common sense um, in artistic communities, political communities, um, towards a more sort of explicitly anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist, um, anti-colonial, as well as anti-oppressive um, sort of uh, context and framework, um, a revolutionary socialist perspective, you know, if you will, like, uh, I, I think um, is one of the places where I find excitement and hope um, because I think that, you know, nothing, my, my sort of sense is that nothing much will change um, if we're not able to sort of confront um, these problems at their roots, which to my mind are, you know, um, capitalism sort of drive towards endless growth and expansion um, and the ways that imperialism and colonialism have sort of carved up the globe and created these sorts of inequalities that other panelists have spoken to. So yeah, again, it, it, and as long as, and it, it, you know, as long as there's not a sort of mass opposition um, to those sort of phenomena and those systems, I don't think that our sort of individual interventions are gonna get very far. So I think I draw hope from um, seeing, again, the sort of like that kind of shift in sort of common sense, the sort of contest, contesting for hegemony um, you know, in a sort of one way to put it. Um, yeah, that's that's a little, sort of long-winded way of, of saying where, yeah. I, where no, I get hope. That's right. Lots of big words. Lots, there's, <laughs> there's so much to unpack, you know, there's so much to unpack and yeah. wherever wherever you can find any hope, hold on to it. Maybe mm -hmm. Kaylee, we might ask you the same question, whether like, if you've very experienced good. hope very quickly in the last in the last couple of months. Totally. I mean, I have to agree with Daniel, Sarah, just seeing some of our bigger institutions make that shift really recently has been extremely hopeful. And I'm also seeing Katie's question in the Q&A about um, is our industry starting to be more supportive around climate justice? And I, I want to say yes. In my day job, I work in arts administration and I work with some of those bigger institutions doing coordinating tours and I'm just hearing so much more definitely about climate justice in, in terms of like making tours more sustainable uh, climate wise and, and, and thinking about the way we travel but also it's just becoming a lot easier to talk really explicitly about justice and um, all those intersectional struggles that we've been talking about and to be able to be at work and say you know, are we are, are we doing performances that are aligned with like the defund the police movement and uh, things like that, that I think would have been really radical to be able to say um, in a kind of institutional setting a couple of years ago. So really all of that is thanks to some amazing activists and movements who have pushed those conversations forward. And I just, it's nice to be able to be explicitly in solidarity with all those different struggles um, and to see some of those movements coalescing in Toronto. One of the most hopeful things has just been seeing the progressive movement in general come together and know that when we when we're talking about um, abolishing police and prisons, when we're talking about climate justice, when we're talking about migrant rights and indigenous sovereignty, like we have friend organizations that are working together and showing up for each other. So that's really hopeful for me. Yeah. Power to the people. <laughs> um, Guys, we're just about running out of time, but I'd love to ask Emma and uh, Leila Jane just very quickly, is there any one person that you're really um, inspired by in the kind of sustainability climate, climate justice. justice movement at the moment? Any one person, um, maybe even Leila Jane, if it's someone in, in the music industry who you think has been a really strong voice at getting the message across? Um, and then Emma, I suppose as well, like it, anyone that you found um, that you, you'd really recommend us all kind of checking out as well. I'm, I'm always interested to hear if there's any kind of new voices that are, are worth listening to. Uh, 
Well, I mean, uh, what comes to mind for me, um, because I, I'm kind of more in tune with the vegan movement, so I've noticed how, I, I know this isn't like, everyone knows him, Joaquin Phoenix has like recently just started being way more vocal about it and I just think fair play to him like um you know <laughs> if you have the 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 stage and the platform you should be talking about these issues that no one really wants to know about because you know it's it's the truth and so that that's Thank what you. comes to mind at the moment oh, that's great that's a great answer yeah. <laughs> and Emma is there anyone in particular um I think for me, um, probably everyone knows her already, but Vanessa Nakate for me is a big inspiration because she was able to achieve so much at a young age, despite so, so, so many hurdles. I mean, I, even though we, yes. we are also most an African girl, I, I cannot even imagine what it takes to raise awareness in your country and then all over the world with very limited means. So I, I draw inspiration from her, even though I'm not, I don't know, I don't think I'm an activist per se. Um, I haven't really like gotten into the space, but uh, I am very impressed by what she has done and what she has done for the world, what she has done as, you know, just as a person. So I, every time I feel down, like, oh, no one's gonna listen to my message or um, people don't care about sustainability. I think of her and I'm like, okay, if she can do it, certainly I can give it a try. All that energy. <laughs> yes, amazing. That's brilliant. Well, listen, like, guys, I think that's the end of the time that we have for our Q&A. Thank you so much for sticking around. I know it's late on a Monday night. You're probably wrecked. Um, but just want to say thank you so much again. And thanks to Becca for organizing this whole um, party. Um, Becca, maybe if you want to just finish things off or we're happy to wrap it up. Uh, yeah. So thank you to you all for coming, our panelists. Uh, Geraldine and Taz, our wonderful moderators, and all of our audience, thank you so much. I've also got Katie and co-organiser. I don't know if Katie wants okay. to say anything as well. Katie, Katie, where are you? Oh, I'm here. <laughs> Hello, I'm currently in my pyjamas, so I shall not um, put my camera on. But yeah, thank you so much. I'm honestly like flabbergasted at how amazing this turned out and at how inspiring all of your sections were and I'm going to be re-watching this again and again once we eventually process this file mm -hmm. <laughs> so thank you so much and I'll be compiling a document with all of the resources that you've put into the chat box and all of your websites Instagram handles Facebooks everything so in case you're wondering what any of the other panelists are up to and want to stay in touch you'll be able to find it there. I'll send it on separately to all our panelists and as well to all the attendees who've put their email into the registration link. So look out for that. Thanks Thank again, everyone. All. Thank you all so much. It was so nice to spend the last few hours with you guys. Yeah, and feel so inspired. Feel so inspired. We it's hope that you have a wonderful week, a wonderful month and a wonderful life. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.